Good afternoon. My name is Venkat Lakshmi, and I'm the John L. Newcomb Professor of Engineering in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Virginia. And my name is Casey Calloway. I'm the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Mobile in Alabama. As the co-chairs of the Planning Committee, we welcome you to the second day of the National Academy's fourth workshop in the series on communities, climate change, and health equity. We are hopeful that these workshops will help pave the way toward ex exploring health risks posed by flooding events, enable discussion that will lead to effective adaptation strategies for community resilience, and foster partnerships among government, academia, and the private sector, allowing us to implement workable and successful strategies at the local level. I'm sure some of you have been, had attended or had seen the recordings of the workshop, the first day of the workshop on Wednesday, the 13th of March. Uh, some brief recap of what we discussed and what kinds of ideas we came up with at the end of the day are as follows. Firstly, I think the most important conclusions which the participants engaged with are communication. Communication and connection with communities, uh, everybody having different expertises, such as engineering, landscape planning, community groups, community activism. Uh, all of these are very important to help advance advocacy, empower people for a shared solution uh, and breaking down the silos between people and you know harness that social community expertise. Flooding is a risk. It's a huge risk. And you know FEMA maps have to be updated to mark up areas of flooding. Uh, a 100-year flood yesterday, another 100-year flood today results in a much larger number for tomorrow. Interventions multiple touch points between insurance, property insurance, health, healthcare, zoning, community groups, clinics are really important points of emphasis which the participants arrived at on Wednesday. Surveillance, interpretation and resources, allocation during or after a disaster, the supply chain of resources is very important because all disasters are different and getting disaster relief to the ones most impacted is quite important. All of this leads us to conclude that reinvesting in communities with the express idea that long-term equitable investments, long-term solutions, and especially investing in excellence of workforce development is very important. So, and the goals for today's, for the second half of the workshops are really to focus on solutions, adaptation strategies that will improve community resilience and remove, reduce health inequities. To accomplish this, we have four sessions. And in the interest of time, all the biographies can be found on our website. And Charles is posting that on the, on the link. In session one today, you'll hear from keynote speaker, Amy Chester from Rebuild by Design, who will set the stage for today. In session two, we have three speakers who will share partnership success stories. Session three, we'll hear from a panel of experts in different sectors as we start to co-create and suggest solutions to the barriers we identified in our breakouts on the first day, a lot of the work that Venkat just talked about. This will include an invitation for you to get involved. All participants, we want you to enter your solutions online as well. And finally, in session four, we'll invite you to join the breakout rooms to address and flush out the most popular solutions. At the end of this workshop series, we'll produce a report in the format of a Proceedings in Brief, or PIB. The link to the last PIB on extreme heat was posted in the chat. And these workshops are designed to be highly interactive and to look at case studies reflecting people's lived experiences so we hope that all attendees will take advantage of these experts that you have and you're hearing today, ask questions and share your thoughts about how complex problems can be solved. Those complex problems, especially focusing on today on flooding and that it's disproportionate impacts on low income communities. The overall goal of this workshop series is to help pave the way for your communities to engage with these and other experts who have found and implemented solutions to climate change impacts. 
We're excited for what has started and we're looking forward to today. So it is my pleasure to introduce first our moderator for the first session, one of our wonderful planning committee members, Sarah Hughes. Sarah is Associate Professor of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan and a Senior Policy Researcher at RANT. Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce this first session. Uh, so as Casey said, the goal of this first session is to really get us started focusing on solutions and thinking about and envisioning what innovative adaptation sol solutions look like in this space, um, and specifically uh, digging into the need for multi-sectoral strategies and collaboration um, as we explore flood adaptation strategies to support health equity in particular. So we have a fantastic speaker for this first session, Amy Chester, who is the Managing Director of Rebuild by Design. Uh, today, Amy will provide some insights from her work into how multipurpose infrastructure can provide opportunities for responding to climate change in ways that provide a whole range of benefits. Uh, so just a couple of logistical items before we uh, bring Amy on. Um, a reminder that we've got about 15 to 20 minutes for the presentation so that we have enough time, lots of good time for questions at the end. Um, Amy, I'll send you a two minute warning in the chat. Um, and audience members, you are very much invited to submit questions at any time using the Slido platform. Um, so that link will be in the chat. And you can add questions in Slido. You can also upvote the questions that you would most like to hear answered if someone's if someone's put an idea in there that, that you'd really like to see highlighted. And so we'll address as many of these as possible after after Amy after Amy's talk. Uh, we can use the chat for comments and just ask that you use that function wisely. And with that, I would like to uh, bring Amy on and um, welcome her to get started. Thank you at the same time that I'm speaking. So I gave myself a timer, so we should be okay. Um, I'm Amy Chester. I'm the director of Real Rebuild by Design. And this is actually how we got started. This is Hurricane Sandy hitting the Northeast United States now. 11 and a half years ago. And this is how it left our community. 650,000 homes damaged or destroyed, 8 million people without power, mostly focused on New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. But these images could be from anywhere. They could be from Hurricane Irma or Harvey um, or Irene. Communities are dealing with this more and more often. And what it has shown us is the inter connection between physical resilience and social resilience, that we need to have that social infrastructure that brings us together, that enables us to know our neighbors, that enables us to be able to check on each other at these really crucial times. And these times are happening more often. These, This is NOAA's significant anomalies um, for last year, but they actually publish anomalies every single month. So it's not something that is happening once in a while, even though the definition is something that deviates from the standard, the normal, or the expected. And we also know that planning ahead really pays off. Every dollar that we put into flood infrastructure has at least a $6 return on investment in public health, in property value, in cleaner water, et cetera. So we have to ask ourselves, like, how do we want to adapt and what does adaptation look like for us? And there's many different ways to approach this. And we can look back at some of the experiences that other cities have had around the world. Venice has been adapting for more than 100 years. And for a very long time, they put out these kind of walkways and just pretended that everything was completely normal and tourists had a good time just playing in the floodwaters. But what we also know is that those flood borders are not healthy. They have a lot of pollutants in them, they have a lot of garbage in them, and it's actually going to make us sick. So Rebuild by Design uh, was launched by the federal government right after Hurricane Sandy. And the idea was to bring federal, I'm sorry, bring international experts to communities and local governments around the world to rethink the opportunity to adapt to 
climate change. So always looking at big scale infrastructure policies. And it was created because at the time, you know, a typical design process did not work. Here was Hurricane Sandy. The only thing that we had really experienced in our lives was Hurricane Katrina five years before. And we, you know, kind of looked at that as a one time off. Now with Hurricane Sandy, we realize this is going to happen more and more often. But a typical design process means that you know what you want to build at the end and you back into it. So let's say it's a, a school or a hospital, you know how many beds, you know the land that you have, and you basically back into that timeline and budget and figure out how to get it done. But after Hurricane Sandy, we didn't have the answers, so we had to create our own process. And we took kind of a... Um, a nod from what product design has done for a long time. And the definition of inf of innovation and in project, sorry, innovation in product design is taking two things that already exist and putting it together in, in a new way. Here's some examples of this. This is um, kind of an image that I remember very well from my childhood. This is LL Cool J. I grew up in Brooklyn. I saw kids on the street that were older than me with that boom box. And it was kind of like, it, it felt you like you had the world at your fingertips because everybody could hear what you wanted to listen to. But then products kind of changed. And all of a sudden we had a Walkman that we could put in our pocket that had a tape. And then before you knew it, we had CDs that could store a lot more songs. And then lo and behold, we used to think it was great to, to store 25 songs, but all of a sudden we could start storing a thousand songs. And then these iPods actually got smaller. So you can put them even in that fifth pocket that you have on Levi's. I remember that being in the commercial when it was rolled out. And then of course, now we have that same device that we use to listen to music, but it wakes us up in the morning and it gives us our news and it connects to our friends and it takes pictures. And it's the only thing that we need to have in our pocket. And this is kind of same approach could be um, also applied to multi-purpose infrastructure. And here are some examples. I think a very easy one that we have in a lot of communities now is our shared road. Roads are not only for cars, but they're for pedestrians and they're for bikes. There are um, many different types of buildings that are also producing energy like this one is. And then you have larger scale infrastructure that is producing flood protection that can actually mask that flood, that flood protection in a different purpose. So this is in the Netherlands. This is a parking garage that you can see also has public art on it and has more recreational space. And it divides the water from the community. Another example in Netherlands has been ex exported all around the world, and that is water squares. They're a playground during dry days. When it rains a little bit, they're just a bit of a water square and you could splash around. If it rains more, it's rain storage. And then it even can be an ice skating rink. And this is what it looks like in Rotterdam, but you can actually see this now even in Hoboken. There are parks that are also flood protection, but they also host museums and other social value. And then if you wanna go kind of far out, but it actually exists too. In Denmark, there's a ski slope that's also a power plant. So you can actually ski down it, whether it's snowing or dry days. So we created what we call a design detour, which is not the typical design process, but really about collaboration, having collaborative research and collaborative design. So we are both researching and designing with the communities that are going to use the infrastructure, with experts from around the world, with interdisciplinary people who bring all different types of their background and experience. And one of the reasons to do it is because the, the out come and the projects are much better because they deal with a different host of vulnerabilities, but you also have an enormous amount of people that will support the project. So as our infrastructure needs to be upgraded over the next generation, as different mayoral um, terms change, as budget cycles move, you have a group of people both in government and outside of government that want to see these visions happen. And we've taken the same process all around the world and have worked on many, many different scales. And after going and spending in a long time uh, in the Bay Area, I became really interested in what was or was not happening in our hometown of New York City and realized um, that as I've been working at Rebuild by Design for many years and paying attention to what was happening on the coast, 
Actually, all over New York State, there was many issues of flooding. And we created this very simple map that showed the frequency of disaster declarations. In this case, it was only for flooding. And in this case, it was both for state and federal disasters. And realized that upstate was having the same experiences that downstate was. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, it was a coastal problem. It was a riverine problem. It was a Great Lakes problem. And me, with a background in political organizing, I realized that, wow, we can actually convince the governor to do something pretty big to adapt. So we um, asked him to create a resilient infrastructure fund and did an enormous amount of work and got an enormous amount of people lined up to support this. And within three, within one year, he introduced a $3 billion, what's called a bond act in New York, which goes to the voters to approve. And um, it was taken, it was put on the ballot within a year, taken off the ballot within a couple of months during COVID, but then put back on our ballot with, the, with our new governor, Governor Hochul, who raised it to $4.2 billion. And this was um, passed by voters about a year and a half ago. And New York now has $4.2 billion. And we took a step back and wanted to understand, like, what was it that made this work? Within a year, we went from no organizations or very, very few organizations working on climate resilience at the state level to creating a $4.2 billion bond act. And we thought that we, we have figured it out. It's because we were able to show that climate change is here. It's not about what's coming in the future, that communities are suffering, and that it's happening on our governor's watch, and it's his responsibility to do something about it. So as soon as the New York Bond Act was introduced, we started looking at all the other states and trying to figure out if we can replicate this research for the same purpose so we can come up with funding solutions for different infrastructure for all different types of communities that need it. So we um, released Atlas of the Disaster. It's a huge report. It's about 670 pages. It has 300 maps. It has a lot of different pieces in it. It talks about the cost of inaction. It has a step-by-step -step, step -step guide for states to build a collaborative program, new financing tools, et cetera. And what we found is the same thing as we found in New York. Whether the state was urban or rural, Republican or Democrat, coastal or riverine, they were still suffering just as we were. And we know it's not just the first impact, it is the longer term impacts that also have our community suffering over decades. This is um, a uh, an image that we created for our report that talks about the different health impacts, the, long the short term, medium term, and long term health impacts of different types of climate events. It was recently republished by Scientific American who took our same data and um, put it in their February magazine. And these events are really hurting people. More than 3 million people lost their home to a disaster. And that's gonna keep on happening, whether there's disasters. Um, in addition to sea level rise, there's gonna be slow movements of people from the coast and also slow movements of people from other countries really changing where they're living. We um, have learned that in the last 11 years, over 20 million people have moved because of a disaster, a climate disaster, 80% of those people being women. So you can check out our report, Atlas of Disaster, and kind of the most interesting piece of it, I think, is that we created packets for every single state so you can see what's happening in your community. So here's an example of a packet. Every single state has like a kind of global view of where the state sits. So you know if it's on a coast or if you know it's in a dry area. And then we have a summary of statistics that are both our statistics and other statistic statistics such as Superfund sites and wastewater discharge sites and what the American Society of Civil Engineering gives as an infrastructure report card. And then we create the same red map for every community. So this is the state of Alabama, and you can see that there are 22 disasters that happened, that where FEMA is putting their funding, the social vulnerability index, the energy reliability index, and we create a new way of looking at it that essentially gives the argument that if we didn't wanna have the biggest financial return on investment, 
but we want to have the biggest social return on our investment, what would be the indicators that we might use to figure out where to invest first? So on the left-hand side, we have a number of different, probably about a dozen different of sources that we've used to create this map. And then we make it very simple on the right-hand side, um, just using some indicators that we kind of collapse. So health indicators, we have three different health indicators in here, poverty rates, different types of climate events, and you can see the areas that would have the biggest social impact. Then we published all of the data and um, here is what it looks like. So for every single state, we have the, the years going across the top, the, the FEMA number, so you can look into it, what type of storm you had. And then we have the counties on the left-hand side and the number of disasters. So you can look up how your community is faring against others. And this is what it looks like for the entire US. We found that 90% of US counties had a federal disaster declaration between 2011 and 2021. So that's 90%. We took it to FEMA, to the White House, to HUD. You know, As soon as we learned this and we asked them, does anybody know this? And it had not been figured out before then. And it was interesting to look at the disasters kind of ranked next to each other. And we saw that California was on the top, but we were very surprised to see Mississippi, Oklahoma, Iowa, Tennessee, Louisiana afterwards. These are some places that we know might have had a storm here or there, but we didn't realize that these are areas that these are places that have had 20 or more disasters during this time period. We also realized that Arizona and Nevada were at the bottom, and we knew at the time that they had the highest heat deaths in the United States, and we wanted to understand why. And what we learned is that the federal government doesn't give disaster declarations for heat because it doesn't have an economic loss. It only has a mortality loss. And this is a big issue for our for our society because it's going to continue to get hotter and hotter and hotter. Um, NOAA has said recently that there's a 45% chance that 2024 is going to be the warmest year in history and a 99% chance that it's going to rank in the top five. And I can tell you, I'm in New York right now, and we had a beautiful day yesterday. It is not March weather here in New York. But we look at this as an opportunity because we can imagine our communities differently with infrastructure that actually improves them that we can take a step back and say, what are the type of communities we wanna live in and how are we gonna build that together? How can we create infrastructure that increases health and mental health outcomes, designs new recreational space to decrease cardiovascular disease, uses green infrastructure, which has a ton and ton of benefits. We can actually create whatever we want if we decide upfront that is what we want to design for. So in 2013, we launched a Hurricane Sandy design competition with the federal government and many partners. And that design competition uh, resulted in seven projects that were originally awarded $930 million. They now have over $4.3 billion in those projects. And what's good about them is that they're actually examples of what I'm talking about. You can take a look at these projects and you can see the social benefit, the recreational benefit, the health benefits in these projects. Here's one example. It's the Big U in Lower Manhattan. About half of it is under construction right now. And that's rethinking public space to be parks and other social infrastructure, um, and also to, to provide that flood protection. Living breakwaters are offshore breakwaters off of Staten Island, which is the area that has really hard beach erosion that has taken away um, you know, the beaches and it's essentially showing the infrastructure um, and the homes making it very, very vulnerable. And these are offshore breakwaters that are created with a special type of concrete that really thought about increasing the ecological benefit. And even before the breakwaters were finished, there was a seal sitting on top of it during construction. We know it's already working. And then lastly, in Hoboken, New Jersey, they have a really amazing uh, program called Resist, Delay, Store, and Discharge, which has totally rethought their streets and public spaces and is using green infrastructure. And as they implemented the green infrastructure, they've also done it in such a way that has completely gotten rid of pedestrian deaths. So there are now zero pedestrian deaths in Hoboken using green infrastructure. And you can learn more about it at this Times article. So what I wanna tell you today is that climate change is not coming. Climate change is here 
and we can do something about it together. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Amy. That was a fantastic presentation and what a great way to get our day started today. So much to um, to think about and, and include or get our, get our minds going. Um, I'm looking at some of the Slido questions. One quick, um, the kind of clarification question that came in is whether Puerto Rico is included in the statistics you're showing. Um, yeah, so it's not included in the statistics, but it's included in our report. I actually don't remember the technical reason why we couldn't use um, that territories. I think it's because we couldn't find, oh, that's what it was. We couldn't find all of the data for our territories. Great, okay, yeah, great, thank you. Um, lots of themes that I saw come up too, that tied into some of the things we we're talking about last week. Um, uh, where do I want to start? I think for the first question I might pose is uh, having to do with issues around green gentrification. So this came up, at least in my sessions, a fair bit um, last week. And I know, I, I, I'm curious, partly I'm curious how this comes up in places outside of the U.S., but let, even just let's think about the U.S., um, how are you thinking about green gentrification in your work or what kinds of strategies have you seen that are promising or, or useful for kind of navigating those kinds of issues? Thank you for asking that. It is a really hard problem that's happening everywhere. I remember the first time during our research stage of the Hurricane Design, Hurricane Sandy Design Competition, I took one of the designers to um, good old Lower East Side, which is um, environmental justice justice advocate, an amazing community group that's been there for about 20 years, and just told them about what we were working on, wanted to get their feedback, wanted a partner on it. And the executive director, Damaris Reyes, said, nope, I don't want it. I don't want any of it, because that's going to gentrify our community. And I literally took the presentation that was on a laptop, and I slapped it down because I knew that she wasn't going to be talking about anything else. And I said, look, how can we work together to make sure that it doesn't happen? And I don't think that we have figured out what that looks like, but I think that um, calling it out from the very beginning and making sure that there is a affirmative way to, um, to deal with this is really important. In her specific area, most of the lower income, if not, I mean, like most meaning like probably 85% of the people who are lower income in that area live in either NYCHA or affordable housing that that cannot be, um, they cannot raise the rent. So those are protected in that area. And we talked about that a lot. Um, one of the things that Rebuild is doing right now is a project that we call Making Space for Our Neighbors. We actually did a uh, study with Millman to understand what the displacement risk is for New York City. Um, and we did that by understanding who lives in the areas that are most at cr in crisis. Um, for that, who are the people that might be able to afford to move first? Where would they likely move? And then who would they displace? And where would they likely move? And that's according to how much you're paying for rent and how much the other areas in New York City um, are, are cost for rent. And what we found is that without intervention, up to 40% of New Yorkers could be displaced for climate just from storm surge, just from storm surge. For up to 40% of New Yorkers could be either primary displaced or secondary displaced. Mm -hmm. So we now are um, have created a program called Making Space for Our Neighbors. And we wanna make sure that every time we're talking about any type of mobility, we're also creating housing opportunities nearby in the city neighborhood. So if people need to move, they're not being displaced from their neighborhood. They're, they're able to stay in their neighborhood and give them opportunities before it's kind of a reactionary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that makes tons of sense. So certainly thinking about it and, and planning for it way up front. And, and this is something I heard a lot last week too, is the importance of having those conversations and, and, and dialogue and keeping, keeping those channels, um, really open. I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, here's a question that came in. So you mentioned at the beginning, the importance of social infrastructure, you're kind of talking about there, you know, the importance of both physical and social infrastructure for community resilience. Um, and so I think, I think the question is, you know, how, what does, what does it look like to have strategies that are targeting that social infrastructure mm -hmm. side? 
um, specifically? How do you think about those strategies for supporting the social infrastructure as a as a resilience investment, let's say, or, or kind of policy change? Yeah, thank you for asking that. And um, Rebuild by Design is in the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University. That's our home now. And that um, institute is headed up by Eric Kleinenberg, who did this really incredible work on the 1995 Chicago heat wave. And that was a horrible heat wave where 700 people died in about a week. And the government didn't really kind of fess up to what was really happening. They were trying to hide it. And his study looked at two communities that are very similar, both had um, the same type of income, the same demographics, but one community had a hundred less deaths than the other community. And what he learned is that the community where people were living near each other, they're able to check on each other. They know that their neighbor usually passes and you know, they didn't see them for a while. If you are getting evacuated, the neighbor can say, come with me to the evacuation shelter. They wouldn't you know, maybe necessarily do that if the government said to evacuate. And it's really a life or death situation. So we hope to put in all of our projects, or not we hope, we put in all of our projects, infrastructure that can help bring communities together. That could be parks, that could be educational centers, that could be programming in addition to what we're doing. Because if you are um, in areas where you are used to seeing your neighbors, you are more likely to fare better during these horrible events. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, this is, the question is, how are you prioritizing projects co-produced with the most vulnerable communities? Um, and I might, I might take the liberty of kind of tying this to what you're talking about with green gentrification or, and even this next question actually too, which is, um, for lower Manhattan, how did you frame the economic argument for the lost tax revenue from the high-rise commercial properties was a cost of disaster versus tax revenue. So to me, I think some of you can interpret this how you like to. I feel like some of this is getting at how do you how do you kind of navigate the the, the project priorities of the community with other policy conversations you might be having. Kind of how does this all get how does this all end up kind of hanging together and get navigated? It's, they're all good questions. And what we have realized working around the world is that there is major distrust in government everywhere. Every time I'm in a new place, they tell me, oh, but our community doesn't trust us. And I'm saying, yes, but nobody's community trusts them. So what we try and do is two things. We For the big Hurricane Sandy design competition, we put actual designers in between government and communities. Hmm. So government and communities weren't negotiating the project. It was more that the designers were hearing from government, hearing from communities, creating designs, going back to them, hearing feedback, iterating on those designs. So ultimately you have something that everybody can support. And a lot of our other processes, um, we usually get brought in. So we don't actually do, you know, kind of decide where to work. Usually a local government or a local foundation or a partner asks us to come and work and solve some type of problem that usually has to do with climate infrastructure. And then with, we always design a process that has partners coming in at the very beginning. So we're making sure that government is working with partners and then together we design that process. And it goes back to what I was talking about, about interdisciplinary minds. If you have a bunch of different people who understand the challenge in a different way, you start learning from them and then you start advocating for what they care about too. And then it becomes very easy to create something that everybody wants because everybody really understands where each other is coming from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that makes a lot of sense. And actually that, um, that feeds into a question I was thinking about kind of toward the beginning of your presentation as well, when you were talking about all that public support and that public support piece for um, these kinds of initiatives. Um, and so I, I think you just kind of answered answered my question a bit. It was how do we get that public? So of course, it's so critical for for you know leverage for getting money act activated, you know, for getting political support. Um, mm -hmm. And so how how we get this public um, public support and engagement? Um, I'll you know. offer another story because I think you need to have the way you get public support is with data. 
um, and showing that it's actually real. So Atlas of Disaster or the work that we did in New York was like very tied to data and saying this is what's happening in your community and you're responsible for it. And we have solutions to do that. Um, another example of how to get some public support with data that isn't necessarily numbers data is after Hurricane Ida, um, her, well, let me go back and say Hurricane Ida hit New York and it was a huge wake up call because all of a sudden every single community, no matter where you were, flooded. And this was the first time that it happened. We lost 13 of our neighbors. It was a horrible moment for us. And we woke up the next morning and realized that there's like this collective feeling that we didn't have the answers. But there's been many people who've been talking about this for a very long time. So the first thing we did was publish um, what we called Ideas for Ida. And those were essays from 20 people that were able to show from different backgrounds of what the city could do right away to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And then in that, as I was talking to reporters, I realized that I'm advocating for turning New York into a sponge and using green infra infrastructure at the nth degree, but we couldn't figure out where, but like what that looked like for New York. So I was Googling and showing other cities, but it didn't really look like New York. So the second thing we did was to create a, excuse me, a report that called out all the impediments for using green infrastructure at the nth degree. We called it rainproof. So towards the rainproof New York and we, in that, um, created images that shows what green infrastructure would look like in New York. What would it look like in public housing? What would it look like at a brownstone and a walk up? So you could really get a feeling of what that works. And because of that, and because we literally called out what wasn't working well, our city's Department of Environmental Protection uh, reached out to us and said, we want to work with you on this. And fast forward now, another about year and, and a half or so, um, we are leading three working groups that are co-led by an agency head and an NGO on rainproofing New York that looks at three different ones of those impediments. And we did a big application process for calling out for people with live or, lived or professional experience. And now those working groups are half made up of agencies and half made up of city, um, I'm sorry, of people with lived or professional experience. So we have broadened the opportunity to not be just about what government's doing, but what are we all doing? What can we do together and how can we support each other? Just another example of some of our work. Yeah, no, that's fabulous. And and it's really um, bringing home for me the, the importance then of, um, I don't know if tailoring is the right word, but um, really specific and um, place-based uh, looks at some of these solutions, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, I think we've got a couple of minutes, so I think we should, we should be able to get to these um, that are rolling in. Um, Here's an interesting question. Okay, so how tall and how many stories can we rightfully and reasonably expect and advocate for urban planners to build as cities are growing? So this is a question of maybe density, but, but I mean, how it's, we expect to go, yeah. <laughs> there's no cookie cutter approach for any yeah. of this. It depends what's underground. It depends what's next to it. It depends what the zoning is. It depends what the uses are. So it, we need to model the type of work we want but then create the projects that are very specific to that community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here's a question. This is something that um, I heard, I know I heard in my session last week. Um, how do you encourage the use of green infrastructure among folks who don't trust it, haven't used it, might fear the maintenance of it, um, when it's something that's not desired in, in a place? I don't know, but we're trying to figure it out right now because <laughs> we are battling that even with New York City, because the standard that New York City um, uses as green infrastructure is not what we're talking about. We're talking about using a lot more and they don't have it in their toolbox. And this is just an example. It could be any city. But one, one of the things that I like to do, for instance, is to show where it's working. And Hoboken is just across New York City, has just done the most amazing resilience parks they have rethought all of their open space. They acquired new land and they are creating parks that have both green infrastructure and gray infrastructure. And that's because the green infrastructure, even at the fullest extent, wouldn't be able to absorb or hold all of it. But they have you know, pumps and other things that were, were needed. But I would say, check out what other cities are doing. Use them as examples. You know, I'll tell you, like, 
people say, well, we can't do that. And I was like, well, why? Hoboken is a tiny place with no budget. And if they could figure out how to do it, then anywhere could figure out how to do it. Yeah, yeah. The power of examples, I'm going to uh, flag that as, as a takeaway or theme as well. That's fabulous. Um, and so that brings us to the end of our time. Um, Amy, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation and just really thoughtful responses to these questions. It's a great way to kick off our second day here. Thank you so much. Um, Take care. We will turn next to um, my colleague and fellow uh, committee member, Katia Walk, to get us set up for the next session. Hi, thank you, Sarah. Apologies for the delay there. It's a bit of technological challenges. Thank you very much. And um, hello, everyone. I'm Katja Woke. I'm a senior social scientist with the Water Institute, and I'm very happy to be here with you today for our second session on shared stories, success stories that are focused on these cross-sector partnerships that, as we've already heard today and last week, are so critical to the addressing the complex challenges um, that we're discussing. So the goal of this session here today is to highlight shared success stories, um, those that are inspiring, right? That are forward-looking, solution-based, and action-oriented. We're looking for those interventions where participants work directly with communities with affected populations, state governments, researchers, implementers, associations, the private sector, right? Really getting at that cross integration. And we have excellent storytellers today to talk with us, uh, speak with us about their experiences and please um, bake your questions as they're speaking, send them into us. We wanna know what they are and we'll have some of that iteration later on. Each speaker is gonna have about seven minutes to tell their story. And then if there's a burning question from um, that that I can see, then we can have just a couple minutes after the presentation, but otherwise we'll reserve that Q&A for the end of the session. So our, our first storyteller today, I believe is uh, Bronco Kirkes. We have, we, have, uh, we have three joining us today. So yeah, okay, we're gonna move ahead with, oh, hello, great, we've got you on video. Hey. Well, wow. welcome. Thank you so much. So Bronco Kirkes is our first storyteller today. Thank you for joining us. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah. Uh, Bronco is the Arthur F. Thurnau Associate Professor and Associate Department Chair for, Chair for Research at the University of Michigan. And we've got you, we've got your slides here, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Please take it away. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Um, can you see my slides? We've got them. Yes. Okay, thanks. cool. So um, I think we've had some really great um, intros already. So I can just, um, I'll try to build on some of those ideas. Um, and so this is just like a, almost a one dimensional technology perspective on some things. Um, uh, just to sort of offer a slightly different perspective and, and hopefully a complementary one by no means, um, by no means something that, um, that displaces other ideas. So basically uh, I wanted to introduce, and I think similar to the, the um, discussions that we've seen so far, just a perspective from Southeast Michigan, where we've had some really massive flooding. In fact, in 2014, um, it was one of the largest floods recorded in the country. I think flood damage was actually the largest um, in that given year. So it's like an inland location. We don't necessarily need to be on the coast to be feeling that pain. And uh, a lot of the folks that are working on this here locally, and these are our partners, um, are span from municipal managers to community groups, all the way down to residents who are addressing a lot of these challenges with the tools that are available at their disposal right now. So that could include big infrastructure solutions, which are only affordable to some, like these big tunnels to kind of take away that flooding, or as we're hearing more and more now, um, these kind of green solutions that are distributed and are supposed to sort of uh, uh, be able to sort of soak up uh, what uh, what the big challenges are, well, what the big solutions are also trying to do. So um, what we're doing in our lab is kind of having conversations with these folks on the ground and our partners um, to try to figure out like, what role, if any, right, and that's to be determined still, do some of these emerging technologies um, pose uh, uh, 
potential solutions, right? And so when we think about different infrastructure uh, sectors like transportation, uh, self-driving cars are becoming a thing. So the question is, does that have anything to do with water? And so what we did in collaboration with a lot of those folks that I showed in the photo earlier was sat down quite a while ago, like over five years ago and said, what does a city of the future look like when we view it from a technology perspective? So complement these, uh, these existing gray and green solutions with things like sensors that are measuring your water levels, your flows in real time, your water quality, your soil moisture, your weather, and integrating that into some sort of place that helps you figure out is what we're doing working, to put it you know, kind of bluntly like that. And then secondly, uh, could we steer these things to do something different? So just like a self-driving car steers itself, could a system like this steer itself in, in response to changing conditions? So again, adaptation strategies through the lens of technology. And so what we've been doing is um, building the sensing devices. So you can see some students installing a water level sensor. This is a wireless device, connects over cellular. We mounted over bridges, culverts, uh, highway overpasses, floodplains, you name it, wherever you can put a sensor. It reports back in real time um, to tell us what's going on in the ground. And so then we put those out with community partners um, in tandem across uh, their communities, across infrastructure, across natural systems to start obtaining that data in real time to see how the systems are functioning. And so here you can just see again some images of students dispersing these throughout our watersheds, throughout our communities uh, to make these measurements um, available. Because as we heard earlier, sometimes we don't have enough data to even know what's um, what's happening. And so this shows you an image of um, about over a year ago, how many sensors we have in Southeast Michigan. So we're talking about a few thousand square miles and really sort of like almost 10 xing the amount of available data that was already um, that was there on the ground to figure out what's going on. And so all those measurements stream back in real time, they go to our lab for analysis and all the kind of research that we do, but they're also piped in real time to the various folks on the ground who are doing stuff with it. And that stuff takes various forms. So when we first rolled this out, like almost, I've been here for almost 10 years now, you know, it was like dashboards. It was like tossing data on the internet, seeing here, here's some data. Um, and what we learned very quickly from people is even though that's useful, it's not exactly usable because a lot of municipal managers and residents, they don't have time to look at data and discern what's happening. We got to sort of like get straight to the application and maybe find some compelling use cases. And so some of those use cases are very simple. Like you have a sensor on a bridge or a highway overpass. And as soon as it detects flooding, it can alert people. It can alert motorists to route around that traffic um, uh, preventing people from going um, into these kind of situations. And so, so simple things like real-time flood warnings is something that we started looking at. Um, but I wanted to focus today on an application real quick in the story about uh, that we've been having in collaboration with the Sierra Club and the Friends of the Rouge, which are two community groups in Detroit. So here we see Irma and Cindy, and they've been deploying as part of various grants and projects that have had green infrastructure throughout the community. And they were interested to know, is it working? You know, just kind of asking that question of the things that we're doing, are they accomplishing what we um, want to do? And in this case, we're trying to figure out how well it works in terms of how well it's infiltrating water into the um, ground. So to do that, traditionally, what you would do is you stick a ruler in the ground, you pour some water in it, and then you figure out how long it takes it to go down. So if it goes down very quickly, that's good. And if it doesn't, that's not good. It's basically ponding. And so to supplement that way of doing it, we build a sensor system that you can stick into the ground and it can measure water levels in real time and then kind of create a historical record, not just one moment in time, but a historical record over multiple storm seasons um, to see what's happening. We deployed them um, with Irma and Cindy and all those various folks across the city. So here we see about 20 stations measuring um, GI, and we got a lot of data. So this was, again, the same story that we saw earlier. Here's a lot of data, but what do we do with it? Because the data themselves are inherently useful. It's useful to have it, but they're not very usable. So again, how do we turn something that's useful into something that actually works for people, right? And, and that's embedded in a lot of these discussions we're having with folks on the ground. And so what we've been able to do with them is sort of summarize all of this in like maps, for example, maps that show you if I put GI in this part of the city versus this part of the city, what ROI am I getting? How well is it going to work? Is it going to pond and look like it's flooded? Is the water going to infiltrate and make people feel better, if you will, if you're looking at it? So what, what you're seeing right now is basically a, an empirical map using sensor data, not assumptions about how the city is laid out, not assumptions about soil types or any of those things. It's an empirical map that shows us how it's working strictly from data. And if anybody's got any questions about why it looks the way it does, it's very counterintuitive. The assumptions we had about how GI should work when installed did not actually end up panning out the way we were thinking. And I'd be happy to go into it later. So again, this was just an example of why having data is um, uh, is important. Uh, so again, that's a little bit more usable. But one thing we also found out from folks was that they have their own ideas. So this could be community groups or residents on the ground that have their own ideas about what they'd like to do, but they don't have the tools to explore if that's going to work. So for example, 
I want to install GI in my neighborhood and I wonder if that's going to help with combined sewer overflows or flooding. So what we did for them is we're riffing off of like a, a, an old video game called uh, Roller Coaster Tycoon, where people can like build their own roller coasters. This is called Sewer Tycoon. Underneath the hood is actually a fully functioning stormwater model, like all the latest, greatest math and AI and all the other stuff. But in the front end, it's a web interface that allows residents and community groups to go in and explore their ideas, get immediate feedback. And the feedback that comes back is technically the, the model that's being used by the city and by the state to make planning as well. So it's putting these tools, whether it's sensors or data or models, into the hands of users through these kind of simple, easy to use interfaces. Again, going from something really useful um, and trying to do the work to make it um, usable. So this is a GI placement um, thing. Um, and then I'll just close off by showing, go, evoking the, again the idea of the self-driving car. It's one thing to get measurements. It's a completely different thing to do something about it when you're sensing it. And so a few years ago, we started building these valves. These are internet connected devices that you can attach to infrastructure, whether it's green infrastructure, in this game, the stormwater basin. And when you press a button over the internet, it opens and closes and you're effectively able to guide the flow of the water in the city. So rather than just letting the water flow downhill, which is what we teach in classes, that's how we design our infrastructure, you're able to say stuff like, okay, it's raining a lot in this part of town. I should let the water flow. It's not raining a lot over here. Let me close that valve and you're dynamically changing what's happening. And we rolled this out in the city of Ann Arbor in partnership with the county and the city. Um, this was actually their idea. And what they basically figured out is by adding real-time control, which is actually fairly cost-effective compared to the building giant infrastructure assets, you're squeezing more performance out of the infrastructure, making more use of it in real time, depending on the storm, depending on the situation. And what they saw is that just by adding these control elements, it makes your infrastructure look as twice as big as it actually is. And it's really counterintuitive, but actually you're using it in a better way and you're changing how it's using or adapting, not just over years, but over um, effectively over like intervals of like minutes to hours. Um, and so what they calculated just for one of those valves that we put in, which was not that expensive really, is that they saved them $1 million on just one of these sites. And so what we've been doing with folks is exploring these ideas at scale. So in the city of Detroit, they have in their sewer system, hundreds of sensors, and they're actually not controlling small valves, but they have these giant inflatable pillows um, that can inflate inside a sewer system and block the flow of that water. And then you're basically changing how the water flows based on whatever decisions you're making. And so we're building these AI systems for the water operators that take in all those sensor feeds and create intuitive interface that's allowed to make decisions about when do I open this gate, this valve, this, this thing. And so the optimizations and everything is running in the background and hopefully trying to make it easier for people to make decisions on how to repurpose their infrastructure. And so I think we're really living in an era right now where not only can we build new things, we can also reprogram existing things, which is a really strange concept to reprogram infrastructure. And it's, it's possible, right? These gates and valves can be reprogrammed to do different things in any given day, depending on the size of the storm. And so in Detroit, we came to a conclusion that even just for a small portion of the system, just by reprogramming the pumps and doing something different, depending on the storm, you would have you can do as much as building a brand new stormwater basin, which they would cost half a billion dollars. So again, these digital upgrades, which is a really strange way to think about some of this stuff, it's still emerging, uh, are not just feasible, but uh, we can do it. And so I'll leave it off here. This was the state of our network um, a little while ago, and we put out a bunch more sensors, and this is the state of the network right now. We're working with folks who've inspired this research across the scale of the whole entire state. And uh, all these dots in a map are our sensors, and they've been deployed by students in collaboration with various folks um, in the communities. So I'll stop right there. Thanks. Wow, that is really cool, for lack of a better word. Wow, that's just got my brain spinning. That's really neat. Um, and the, the resources that are saved by the technology, just incremental gains save so much. That's that's really fascinating. Do we have one, maybe we have time for one burning question from committee members? If we have one. Okay, save your questions for the end because we definitely want to dig into that presentation. Thank you so much, Bronco. Okay, next. Oh, sorry, we do have a question from... Riley Hurst, you have your hands up, Riley. Okay, that may have been a mistake. No worries. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Bronco. Our second storyteller then is uh, Priscilla Rahalmo Alves, who is the lab manager and postdoctoral associate at the Stormwater Infrastructure Resilience and Justice Lab of the University of Maryland. Okay, Priscilla, I see you, wonderful. And are you able to share your screen? Yeah. 
Let me do that now. Can you let me know if you can see it? I see it perfectly. And we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the for the invitation. It's really nice to be here and to listen to all of this amazing research. And it's I'm really happy for being here in this group. So today I'm also talking about the story, our story that I'm working uh, at the University of Maryland. So it's about sewage overflow events and also basement backups. And I just wanted to restart with this image, as we know that it's sewage. Uh, this is happening everywhere, not only here on the US, but also in other countries. If we just do a quick search on internet, like Google or actually research articles, we're going to see a lot of implications for the sewage inside our homes, inside our streets. And as we know, as you can see here on the pandemic, we also saw a lot of research about coronavirus and what were the implications inside with this virus in our, in, in our sewage. The fact is, sewage can bring a lot of implications to our life. So for our health, uh, we can see, we can find uh, a lot of diseases, a lot of bacteria, but it's not very clear how uh, we can analyze them when we do have the sewage backup events happening. So we do have implications for infrastructure. And if we check the data set, if we check maps and location of sewage backup events, if we get the data, we're going to see that this is happening in multiple cities. So the infrastructure that we have for uh, sewage should be protecting us from having this inside our homes, which is the study case for this research. But at the same time, we are still seeing this everywhere. So this map is for Baltimore. You can see the data from 2017 until 2019. And you can see that again, it's happening not in one or two neighborhoods of Baltimore, but actually in many places. So the sewage overflow events and basement backups will release the sewage from the sanitary sewer system, so the municipal uh, sewer system, into the environment before it is treated, which this can bring to us the contact uh, with these hours that are contaminated and also can cause property damage and also can threaten uh, public health. So the sewage backup events will be this relationship, will create the impact for the communities with both environmental and also social perspectives. With this case, we do have our project, which is called Water Emergency Team. So we call us ourselves the WET Team. So again, from the University of Maryland, uh, where we want to translate our findings, not only with the city and community level, as you can see on this, uh, on this scheme here, but actually looking for the household level. So we actually create this methodology with five steps. So we go from resident survey, visual inspection to environmental sample collection, analysis and results, where we also translate our results for the community. The community is involved in all of the phases of our research. So since the beginning, when we go to the properties and then we apply the surveys, we also analyze the properties itself. So that's why we have the visual uh, household inspection tool. We collect some samples from the basements, especially uh, where they had sewage backup events in the past. So we analyze and then we translate the information for the community members. The main objectives that we have on this research is actually to determine the presence of bacteria in standing water, but also surfaces uh, from homes that were impacted by the sewage overflow events in the past. But we also want to understand the awareness of people that are having the, the sewage inside their homes, their previous experience, and the last part, as I said, is to share the results with the community members uh, for actually bringing more empowerment and more information for them. One challenge that we have is actually how can we integrate the environmental side, but also the community side inside our methodology. As we said in the beginning, the sewage backup events, they will have implications for the environment, 
but also for the for the people. So the social impacts. And then what we what we are doing inside this project is actually with all of the bits of it. So always in the property level, always uh, interviewing people that face sewage backup events in the past, always trying to inspect their property. So analyzing their infrastructure. Uh, so assessing the social context, assess, assessing the, the current infrastructure, getting the samples from the places that had sewage backup events in the past. So we, we prepared this kit uh, and I'm going to show a little bit of it for you afterwards, where we can actually collect uh, the samples from these areas and take these to the lab to have this analyzed to see if they have any presence of uh, any type of bacteria because of the sewage backup events uh, in the past analyze the data from the surveys, analyze the data from the inspection tool, and how to actually translate that in a way that the community members, they will understand that, and they will also learn how to deal with the sewage backup events. So as I showed in the first map at the beginning of the presentation, we our uh, our project is mainly based in Baltimore, so Baltimore is a is a huge city. So the la the largest city in Maryland, we do have the majority of Black Americans in the city, so sixty one percent. At the same time, we also have a high rate of people that are in poverty, so almost twenty percent, almost twice of the national average. And from the data, we also see that there is a lot of sewage backup events happening in the city. So according for the Chesapeake uh, Bay Foundation, we do we did have more than, so this is not uh, only for 2011, but we actually see a lot of sewage backup events happening in the city. As I said, we do want to have the engagement with the different community members in our research. So we kind of build this uh, engagement model. So you can see the steps A, B, C, and D. We are always interested in the, po in the uh, property level. But how can we actually put all of the information together? This was one of the, our main challenges. So the first step is actually to see the sewage backup events. It's not very easy to have this information uh, where we actually go to the data sets. It's challenging to see where the events are happening because people need to complain about it. Sometimes the data is not available to us. So we are building these maps uh, to understand more about the location of the sewage backup events. We are also identifying stakeholders. Uh, so we are doing meetings, door-to-door -door recruitment. We are attending community fairs and events and also doing some educational sections, as you can see on these schemes. When we go to the property, uh, we are applying some strategies with the community members, so surveys, the inspection tool, and also the sample collection. And the last part is actually to report back the results for the community members. You can see our team here, uh, some of the photos. One strategy that we are always doing for the engagement is to actually find a way to communicate with them. We actually thought that uh, we learned from the experience with this project that we actually need to find people on the ground that can help us because people will actually want uh, to communicate with them and then they can get to know of us. And actually we saw that we, we can build this trust with the community. So we prepared these flyers, we are attending the event, and then we are getting signups of people to actually have, so people that had sewage backup events in the past, they can sign up. Uh, and then we will go to their homes and do and apply all of the strategies. So you can see uh, some of the materials that we have in our sample collection kit. Uh, on this part, it's also important to mention that it is another challenge that we that we find that we need to collect the samples and then we need to fulfill a lot of rules to actually have the sample analyzed in the lab. Uh, so in this part, we actually take the sample to the wall lab, 
uh, at the University of Maryland. And then the samples, they need to be analyzed in 24 and 48 hours uh, for us to see if they have the presence of any bacteria inside their basement. So, so far, uh, we actually sampled 88 houses. So this is from um 2021 until now uh on the second phase of the project now we are actually expanding the project to not only baltimore but other places inside maryland so prince george county uh and also montgomery county in the future we are attending the community events so we now we have more than 600 participants so festival community meetings school events, community organization events. And then we all we also have students involved from the different levels. So PhD, master's students, undergrads from movement planning, where, where is the, the lab that I work? So the search lab, but also from public health, uh, where do we do have one of the PIs of our project. So one is from urban planning and the other one is from public health. So we have students in both places. So the main takeaways of this project are that we do lead inter, uh, an interdisciplinary approach for understanding sewage backup events. So we do know that the sewage backup events will have implications for public health and infrastructure, but we also want to understand more about the social implications. It's also important to understand more about the location itself, so the nature of the sewage backup events, which can be from dry and wet events, so more related to critical infrastructure, but also the rainfall itself, and also that we need to encourage community collaboration and engagement from the different phases of the research, which, which is one of the main things that uh, we have on this project. So since the beginning with attending the community events, finding champions uh, on the ground that can help us, but also translating the results of our research to the people again, so they can understand what they are facing and how can they mitigate the sewage backup events. So give information in support uh, and then that's it that's us part of our team uh the universe of maryland and then we also have some social media for the project if you are interested you can contact us uh, for the water emergency team <laughs> thank you yeah, i will be following y'all for sure we had one question come in we had quite a few but one was how is this approach community driven toward the beginning of your slides but i think we we well understand now Okay. Great approach. So we'll hold questions until we have one more panelist today, and then we'll have a good discussion. So please can continue to contribute your questions to Slido. And with that, I'd like to introduce our final storyteller here today, Angela Chalk, who is the Executive Director of Community Health Services. Thank you, Dr. Chalk, for joining us today. Uh, and please, are you able, to, do you have slides for us today? Oh, I think uh, if you could unmute, I'm not sure that we can hear you yet. My apologies. I, I've submitted the, sl the slides to uh, to Charles, so it's one yeah. slide. Yeah, and um, our organization is Healthy Community Services. We're based my, okay. here. My apologies. That's, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No worries, no worries. We're based here in the seventh ward of New Orleans, Louisiana. And through the NAS grant that we received, we are the lead community-based organization with other community-based organizations, uh, Waterwise Gulf South, um, Bundy Friend Neighborhood Association, and the Greater Treme um, Consortium. However, we work, we work across six predominantly Black African-American communities, but specifically um, the funding that we received from NAS will, will, is looking at um, H and H modeling for um, the seventh ward, the upper ninth ward, and the Treme communities. So um, let's get started. So who we are? We are a collective of organizations, with the umbrella organization being Waterwise Gulf South. And what this does is it allows us to share resources um, where there's overlap, so that we're not competing for funding. However, each organization organization operates uh, separately and autonomously, but we work together collectively where we have common interests such as advocacy for, uh, for policies around stormwater management, um, 
But to give you just a base about healthy community services itself, we work at the intersection of climate health and public health, um, being that we focus on stormwater management and resiliency, climate adaptation for our coastal resiliency and urban ag, which allows us to um, provide um, community education to residents for those who are lacking access to healthy food choices. And so being a part of, of a collective like this, we're able to um, complement each other's services and complement the goals and values of each of the organizations. And we pool together our resources so that we are stronger together um, so that we can have the benefit in all six communities that Waterwise Gulf South is um, concentrating its efforts in. But most importantly is that we all share, excuse me, we all share in this and love the city that we live and work in. So we live and work in the communities. We are legacy residents of the communities that we work in. However, we know that because of the lack of maintenance in an aged gray infrastructure, we know that we need green infrastructure and green in interventions to help us to mitigate the effects of um, repetitive flooding due to severe weather impacts. And so what you see in the center of the um, picture here is one of the turbines that um, the company is no longer in, that manufactured it is no longer in existence. And so it, it's not able to keep up with the amount of rainfall that we're receiving uh, because of the intensity and the frequency. It's a 100 year old pump. And you, if those of you who are familiar with New Orleans, you'll always hear about turbine uh, number four does not have enough power to generate, to push water out, um, to reduce flooding in our streets. And so as you see the pictures, this um, just above that, um, that's just an indication of a hard rainstorm that does not include flooding that may occur as a result of hurricanes. This is just plain old everyday hard rainstorms that are occurring more frequently. Um, you all look at the, the weather reports, you know how um, in areas where um, that may have never flooded before are currently flooding because of the intensity and the increased um, changes in our, in our weather patterns. But nonetheless, um, these actions are community-led actions that provide um, residents with the opportunity to take, um, to lead on projects that um, residents may see based on the funding that we receive from the uh, philanthropic support and now um, federal support where we want to see green infrastructure interventions. This spring, and in fact, in about mm, six weeks from now, uh, we will be taking a delegation of 22 neighborhood champions to Amsterdam so that we can use and compare the technology in Amsterdam to how we can apply it here in New Orleans with the hydraulic and hydrological um, studies so that we know where we're best placing our assets to mitigate water. We know where residents say that it's flooding. However, we need to make sure that the science is also backing up what residents are seeing and experiencing in real time. To date, we have 175 neighborhood champions with 180 projects and counting. Uh, we're managing 300,000 gallons of storm water per rain event. And uh, we know that according to the Earth Economics report that we commissioned, that the eco service benefits are $19.3 million annually on both proposed and um, interventions that are currently in, in the ground. We know that because of systematic biases, the disinvestment have been in African-American communities. And so we can't wait for government to take the, to take the lead on this because if so, we would really be underwater. And so that's where the advocacy comes in that we can engage and educate with residents for residents to make the, um, the lead on these interventions and what we wanna see in our communities because we're tired of being studied instead of worked with. And so we use the community spectrum model to engage with residents to see where we're at on that spectrum, whether we're just being tokenized or if we have full engagement and ownership 
of what we produce as a community. And then finally, I'll say that um, working together in a collective not only provides us that professional support, but it provides us personal relief. So when one of us is down, the other one can pick up and maintain the continuity of our projects. We are normalizing uh, motherhood uh, because one of our, excuse me, one of our um, leaders is a new mom to a toddler. And so it's important for us to make sure that uh, we're normalizing work-life balances that if she chooses to bring her baby to work, it's okay for her to bring her baby to work and no one is, um, is looking side-eyed at her. And so that helps to make um, what we're doing uh, a normal, hopefully a, um, a, a projection for the, for the future of how the workplace will look. And then finally, what we also do is work with our, our um, neighborhood champions who are subcontractors so that we can create that circular economy within our um, communities by hiring people that live and work that are trained green infrastructure professionals, uh, as well as working with workforce development training organizations so that uh, their, their participants can have real time, real life experiences um, with green infrastructure. And so our motto is to leave tangible assets in the communities that we live and work in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela, if I may. And as a, as a researcher just coming off of maternity leave myself, I appreciate your work to normalize motherhood. Uh, that's really, it's unfortunately unique, but much appreciated, I'm sure. Um, yes, it is. In fact, he's started our, our baby Cole has started, um, his mother started him with um, nursery twice a week. And he has been at all of our meetings from birth until now. And when, when she came in, it was like, oh, that's right. He's at daycare. And so everyone is, it's normal. Everyone is expecting him to be here. Uh, we know that working with our children, because our children and youth are the leaders, we have to start them young. And we've literally started from the womb. That's what I was thinking. I mean, talk about raising our leaders, right? That's really yeah. impressive. It does take energy and resources to do that. So it's it's significant for sure. So now, uh, thank you to all of our storytellers for joining us here today and providing us with some excellent examples to consider on how we build these partnerships. We're gonna turn now to Q&A. We've had a lot of input to our Slido questions. So I'll, I'll start um, going through those. I, I have some questions myself too, but I wanna make sure that we get to y'all's insights, right? And, and spur that discussion. Uh, just one operational question. We had one for everyone asking if we could provide the links to the reference materials in the presentations and we'll work with our speakers to um, see what we can offer for our audience so that you can have the excellent resources on which they build their studies. So getting into the presentations more thoroughly, I'm going to start with Bronco first. And there's two practical questions there. Um, one is how well have these technologies worked in real time and not just in a predictive fashion? So do you have any examples about that? Yeah. Um saw that question. I guess if we just think about like real world implications of this, I think the caveat is obviously we're researchers, right? Like there's only so much like real world scale that we can have given our position sometimes we just come up with some of these. But that said, I think we've seen tangible examples in our own use of these, even at a small scale when considering that like it's a bunch of grad students and undergrads carrying out the work, right? So when we talk about these potential savings to building new infrastructure and building the actual like decision support tools, like these, these software systems that help people tell, um, tell them when to open and close gates and stuff like that, we're seeing those savings that I um, put in there. Um, if you want to see it at scale, you can look at um, like South Bend, Indiana is a great example where they adopted real-time control strategies, um, meaning like these gates and valves are opening and closing themselves in real time. Um, that was actually when Pete, uh, Pete Buttigieg was mayor, right? So they they did not have the money to build massive infrastructure solutions. And so as part of the EPA consent decree, they actually got real-time control approved. And there's a, a decade of data being collected there showing a progressive decline in combined sewer overflows and flooding and things like that as a result of the adoption of these um, solutions. So there's 
there's a number of examples and the technologies are scaling out now, you know, I was talking about Detroit, they're adopting it. Um, Buffalo's adopting it. Um, internationally, you can look at a bunch of different places like Denmark um, and other countries. I mean, I can just name a list, but the stuff is being used. It's just a different way of thinking about it. Cause oftentimes when you invest in the software, it doesn't feel tangible. It's like, it's like bits, right. As opposed to infrastructure, which is this physical and tangible things. And you can't cut a ribbon on software, right. It's not how these things work. Um, so it's it's usually kind of like early adopter communities that are using it, but there's sufficient evidence over the last, at least based on our research over the last 10 years or so that shows that the stuff is uh, is is achieving um, um, what it's set out to do. I, I think one one thing to note there is that when these systems roll out, there's measurements associated with it. Um, so typically when we install infrastructure, we just put it in and we come back 50 years later and say it's not working. With these systems, you're measuring in real time and therefore you know if it's not working and you can adjust. So. Um, unlike a lot of other solutions, you, you by nature, you're forced to measure and those measurements can tell you if it's working or not. Sure, sure. Thank you for that. And while I while we're while I have you, um, one more practical question. We live in an era where unfortunately hacking is prevalent. And so this question was just wondering if there's manual overrides to these systems in the event of uh, in, in the event that the network is hacked. Sure. Um, so any new technology is going to have some risks associated with it. There's no silver bullet that just provides all benefits. Um, so naturally, when you connect infrastructure to the internet, which is a strange, it's, it's like not as strange as it used to sound. It sounded really strange like 10 years ago. Um, you're going to assume some sort of risk. And I think it's up to the folks that make those decisions, um, you know, all the way from residents, all the way to the sort of decision makers and the planners and the, and the municipal managers to, to trade that off versus the, the drawbacks. And so um, one thing I can say though, is water systems in the United States are vastly undermeasured. We have no clue what's happening actually most of the time. We're kind of operating the dark, um, like literally just managing infrastructure dark and kind of implementing and praying and hoping that it works. So it's not uncommon for flooding to happen in a city and, and nobody except for the residents knows that it's going on because it's literally affecting them. And so when infrastructure breaks, oftentimes we don't know that it's actually happening. And with systems like this, by connecting them, you find your problems kind of in real time. So that creates some challenges. And so when you add that layer of real-time control, which is more, I suppose, more exotic than just the measurement angle, you're going to have some drawbacks, but somebody's going to have to look at this and, and weigh it. And uh, oftentimes with new technologies, and I'll just close on this, when you introduce a new technology, whether it's sensors or real-time controls, um, you have to somehow show that it's safe. But nobody is uh -huh. showing that other infrastructure is actually safe, right? We just build these things and say they're good and we just build it. And so I think a, a more holistic question would be one of how do we compare the pros and cons of everything as opposed to just the new solutions, um, right? Because because building a tunnel is fine. Nobody's going to complain, but like, is that actually working? I don't know. So uh, anyway, I, I think the, the answer to that is kind of, complex and perhaps nuanced, um, but I think it can be some, lead some cool discussions. Sure. Understand the fuller suite of trade-offs and then make, gather those data, right? And then make sure that they are usable, right? Very cool. So we do have a question from Priscilla, Priscilla which is really interesting. However, um, we'll circle back to that Bronco if we have time, because I want to make sure that we get to our other panelists. So Priscilla, I'd love to turn to you next. So we, we've been thinking a lot about equity during these discussions, and we do have a question from the Slido asking about the tool that you used to distribute the wet survey um, mm -hmm. regarding your project and, and how you ensured equitable access to that work. I know, I, I saw that, and thank you so much for these questions. It's really important. One, one challenge that we see on the project is about the data, right? Because it's not very easy to find uh, the data, we do have uh, some sources and we do have some access, but even though we feel that's not complete, so we, we, we truly think that the sewage backup events are happening in other places as well. What we do is to put this data together with the location of the sewage backup events, but also talking about the issue with the community again. So we do have people on the sites that are helping us. So the representatives of the community, they know so much more than us, the research team. So we are always communicating with them because the representatives, they know where the sewage backup events uh, happens because the community members, they speak with them because they trust them. 
So what we we do is actually to put all of the information together. And then we are also attending the events to have people signing up. So if they hear about the project, we offer a stipend so they can participate in the project because of the, sti uh, the stipend, but also because they had the sewage backup events in the past. So we, we, we try as much as we can to actually go to all of the different groups of people that are having uh, the sewage backup events inside their place. And then the rest, it's funny because the residents themselves they start saying, oh, but I know someone that also that actually also had the sewage backup events. Can you go there? And then we feel that we kind of we are starting kind of this network uh, of people that are having the sewage backup events and always trying to put all of the different data together to actually have the everyone to participate. That's really important. And I heard some important lessons there about local knowledge and harnessing local knowledge as the experts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not non-traditional ways of knowing, right? Um, about trust, you, you mentioned, which is absolutely critical. And then having the resources to, to make sure that these local experts are supported and can participate in yeah. this is really critical. It's one of the things that we highlight because uh, we are going there, of course, that we want to, as researchers, right, we want the data, we want to see what's happening, but they are facing the problem. So yeah. the, the least thing that we can offer is something for their participation. And then so they, they of course, they will receive the stipend. We will have the data, but then the last part of the project will actually be, okay, now you have the, the results. And then with the, the results, uh, we also offer some strategies that they can do uh, to mitigate the sewage backup, at least the impacts uh, of the sewage backup events inside their homes. And then they we also try as much as we can to put a list of resources for them to actually mitigate and then uh, to speak with other people. Uh, yeah, so the, the local champions, uh, just talking about that very quickly, we also have uh, the Blue Water Baltimore which is a nonprofit organization in Baltimore. And they also deal with sewage backup events. So they are also helping us in finding these people and the champions and the leadership, the representatives in the community, and also with some of the resources that we can offer to people to mitigate the, the events. Excellent, local champions, I like that. And I think it moves us closer to the spectrum, the end of the spectrum that Angela discussed which is uh, something you said really hit home with me. We're tired of being studied, right? We, we want to leave these projects. This is our home. And that, that concept of reciprocity becomes so, so important. So thank you for that, Priscilla. And Angela, I'd like to move to you next. And we have a question here for you as well. Um, one of our participants noted that they really appreciated the community-driven study that you presented. We all did. And they were wondering in terms of solutions, I know that you mentioned, for example, um, you had philanthropic funding and then that, that expanded to additional funding. So this question is wondering how your results have helped to bring those resources to the community in addressing some of these, these issues that you're facing. Can you give us a little bit more about that? Well, first of all, let me just say that um, here in New Orleans, we don't have a combined sewer system. So that's the good, that's the good news for us. So we don't have a combined, there's this, the wastewater and sewage are separate. Uh, what has increased our capacity is to be able to access fundings through the Justice 40 initiative and having um, uh, community leaders participate in the Justice 40 um, cohort to be able to learn what federal agencies are looking for in the way of grant applications, how to create a, a grant application, how to have that capacity and policies in place. And so for us, that has been a game changer where um, we were constantly being denied because folks would say, well, you don't have the capacity, you don't have the skills, you don't have the knowledge. When we know that community science community participatory science is a valuable asset to communities um, in a way differently from the way academics may 
study what um, what what we're doing in the community. So for us, having access to those federal dollars, learning what we need to learn in order to build capacity as small community-based organizations, and then finally receiving th that funding, those federal that federal funding and having the capacity and knowledge to be ready to receive those funds. So it's important for us, to, and we realize that it's not only good enough to just um, be able to be awarded a grant, but have the capacity to be able to make those deliverables. And whether that's from um, having internal policies, continuity of structure, um, being able to receive the monies, because we're not, we're talking about more monies than organizations would ordinarily receive from philanthropic um, sources, but to be able to have those resources to put um, tangible and leave tangible assets in communities, but first of all, engaging, educating, empowering residents um, to see what they wanna see in their communities. I can't presume uh, what someone wants in a community just down the street from me, unless we engage residents to understand what their needs are. And let me just add, being a community um, leader and living and working in the community that I serve, I can't be both. I can't be the one who is um, securing funding and resources for the pro for programming and still have residents particip and participate as a resident. And so all of us as community organizations, we take that step back from being a resident and let the residents see um, things through a different lens that we may not be seeing. And so that has worked for us um, as community leaders to let, the, to let it be the residents to speak about what, um, what's, what's needed in the community. And as a benefit, uh, we've all said, mm -hmm, okay, we, we get that. Um, the other most important thing with that is that as um, working in, in a collective, you can imagine we have um, challenges um, on personalities. But what we did agree upon early on as a part of this collective is that no one person's personality would supersede the needs of our community. Let me say that again. No one person's personality would would, would um supersede the needs of the community. And we have stead, we have stead, um, we've been steadfast in that. Um, do we have arguments? Of course we do, but we know what's our priority and that's our communities that we live and serve in. That is a powerful message, Angela, and these <laughs> powerful presentations today. So thank you very much to our storytellers for joining us and helping us think about these challenging issues. We are going to transition now to session three which is going to be moderated by our wonderful and excellent committee co-chair, Casey Calloway. But first we'll take a, a short break, about a three to four minute break, and we will reconvene at 1.35 Eastern time. Thank you so much.
Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome back. Um, this next session is geared to explore <clears throat> an integrated and multi-sectoral approach to arrive at a set of effective, innovative actions for addressing the identified problems and challenges that are related to flooding adaptation and the issues in health equity that we all generated on day one. In other words, today, we are diving into solutions. Now, the goal is to build on the discussion from last week. Very importantly, the National Academies and the committee are committed to this being very participatory and inclusive discussion. So keep on populating the Slido with questions and we have a little bit more that we're gonna do today. But first, we're gonna start by hearing from panelists across multi, multiple sectors, and we'll ask you, the audience, to propose solutions. Each panelist is gonna be proposing one solution. They're gonna talk about, we need to hear from you on the solutions, the actors, and the actions again in that Slido platform. This panel will be most effective as collaborative discussion between and among the panelists and you. So first things first, to accomplish this, the session's gonna be divided into three parts. The panelists will each take just two minutes maximum. Um, there are six of them, so we need to keep it really tight. And we'll include their opening remarks, their name, position, and one major action taken at their levels towards solving a specific flood issue especially as they relate to health and equity. The panel will then have 10 minutes to debate and explore innovative integrated solutions that align with all of the sectors presented. I'm sorry, the facilitators are gonna, sorry, missed a part. Um, the facilitators from each of the four breakout rooms from day one are also gonna present the summaries of the barriers and challenges that were out there. So we'll represent what y'all talked about on Wednesday with the challenges and the panel is gonna take the time to go through and debate and explore innovative integrated solutions. And those solutions also being geared toward aligning with each of the sectors that are represented. Now, again, while the discussion's happening, y'all all play a role. We are asking the audience to submit your ideas for solutions. No more comments and challenges today. We're gonna to stick with what we've got and collected, um, but we wanna get your solution ideas on the Slido platform as you're inspired and while you're listening to the panel discussion. Additionally, attendees are asked to upvote solutions that you find particularly innovative and cross-cutting. So with this kind of blueprint outline, I wanna welcome our esteemed panel. I'm gonna have y'all pop, um, hopefully the team is gonna put everybody in, in so we can look at each other. Um, but I will start with Jesse Bell. Um, Jesse, you have two minutes starting now. Hello, thank you for allowing me to be here today. I'm Jesse Bell. I'm faculty at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I'm also faculty at the University of Nebraska uh, Lincoln. And so there I'm the Clarem Hubbard Professor of Water Climate and Health. I'm the director of the Water Climate and Health Program. And I'm also the um, uh, director within the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute that runs across the University of Nebraska system. I've spent most of my uh, career trying to understand the impacts of climate change and environmental change on human health. I'm particularly interested in how extreme weather and climate events impact um, human health and impact society. I've done a variety of different projects uh, looking at a variety of different extreme weather events um, with flooding being one of those. You know, when we talk about flooding, a lot of times we talk about coastal areas or we talk about areas um, in higher density areas, higher population density areas. But one of the things that became very apparent to me was the impacts that it has in rural communities. About five years ago, I moved to the University of Nebraska um, for my previous role at the CDC in NOAA. And when I made that transition to this position, uh, within a year, we had the costliest inland flooding event in U.S. history. This event led to, uh, where Nebraska was kind of at the epicenter of that event, led to wide scale damage throughout this region. Um, and one of the things that became very apparent was that these types of events don't just have impacts on the immediate, but it has the long-term and delayed impacts as well. What sure. became a two hour drive in Nebraska all of a sudden became a five to six hour drive for a hospital or healthcare. We saw damage to infrastructure and roads. We saw damage to a lot of other uh, issues, uh, infrastructure throughout this area as well. And so for me, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in rural areas to make sure that we're communicating and engaging with communities on the best practices to move forward. Right, 
Thank you. Um, now our next panelist is Ben Money. Money, sorry. Um, ben, make sure you keep your focus on what is your one solution along with your um, telling us a little bit about who you are. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Cassie. I'm Ben Money. I'm Senior Vice President for Population Health at the National Association of Community Health Centers. And for those of you who may not know, community health centers are integrated medical, dental, pharmacy, behavioral health, and enabling service providers across the country. We serve one in 11 uh, U.S. residents through 1,500 organizations uh, operating out of 15,000 clinical delivery sites. Importantly, health centers are patient governed, so the, the people that use the services comprise the board of directors. They also serve anyone regardless of their ability to pay. So over 90% of the patients served by community health centers live under 200% uh, of federal poverty guidelines. They're located in medically underserved areas and they serve medically underserved populations, which means that most of the sites are in environmentally impacted areas. They flood a lot. Uh, EPA, FEMA, Justice 40 communities. Uh, we also care for people during and after disasters. So health centers sit between the public health and the hospital preparedness programs, and they provide care in, in the clinic and out of the out in the community with mobile clinics and outreach during times of disasters. Uh, they help people address social drivers of health, so food, housing, transportation. Um, we uh, are working uh, right now in partnership with two other organizations, um, Capital Link and Collective Energy on a storage, a, a solar and storage program called the Charge Partnership. We recently won an award through the Department of Energy to create solar microgrids on rural community health center sites in the uh, in the southeastern part of the, the United States. I currently live in North Carolina, and I was involved in supporting recovery efforts after Hurricane Floyd and Fran in eastern North Carolina. And the solution that I propose is extending that solar microgrid concept on community health centers and leading to the development of community community resilience hubs with health centers and local community-based organizations uh, pre-planned through the lived experience of the community residents and pre-positioned with resources, strategies, and supports to assist the most vulnerable during these times of disaster and during the, 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 the grueling months afterwards. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ben. Our next, our third panelist is Nicole Boothman Shepherd. She's representing an industry perspective for us. Hi, I'm Nicole Boothman Shepherd. Thank you for the introduction. I'm so pleased to be here. I'm Vice President of Resilience and Recovery at ACOM, and that means I'm the Senior Technical Leader on our Global Disaster Resilience Adaptation and Post-Disaster Response and Recovery Operations. And I've responded to about uh, 16 events. 14 of those have been flood-related. And I've spent about 17 years in total on the road responding primarily to major and catastrophic disasters. So the one um, example and best practice that I want to talk about today is in relation to um, the rebuilding of um, the public school system in New Orleans following Hurricane Katrina. Um, I think you know community consultation, community consultation, community consultation is number one. And, and, and then being an advocate to fight for what the community wants and supporting their priorities um, uh, to the extent to which you can leverage your uh, power as an organization and as an owner and operator in the infrastructure. So that's sort of one half to really be meaningfully and authentically engaged. Um, when the schools were rebuilt, uh, almost 300 meetings were held to develop the school facilities master plan. But instead of um, approaching FEMA, for example, on the $2 billion request for funding as a fight, we sometimes fight when we sit across the table just by nature. But looking for the triple win where the federal, state, and local government uh, can agree on successes in support of community will um, was absolutely integral to the decisions that were made. We had massive amounts of mold and mildew in the schools and remediating those and having asset performance standards, including things like commissioning buildings. So we knew that the air quality, the indoor air quality was going to be good when we had so many 
health vulnerable kids who had asthma and then were exposed to again really high levels of mold and mildew was was absolutely critical. So um, that's what I would posit as a key solution. Um, just move to the additional concentric circles of the agencies you're working with, whether they're your funders or they're your collaborative partners or the people who make the rules and then and then do the work of the community. And, and when you stand by the community, they will stand by you. You know, we had community members come out all the time when we were fighting uh, for the things they asked us to fight for. Thank you. And I think you teed up our next panelist perfectly. Um, Charles Sutcliffe is representing a state government perspective, though he has changed jobs just recently. So I'll let him talk to you about what, what's going on with him. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here. Yes. Uh, so I'm Charles Sutcliffe. I recently left the Louisiana governor's office after 12 and a half years of working primarily on the coastal program. So um, kind of the big Coastal Master Plan, we've been implementing uh, BP funds and, and to some of the world's largest you know, ecosystem restoration projects and, and flood protection projects. Um, but towards the end of my, my time in the governor's office, we also kind of started to, to kind of grow what we were worried about um, in, in terms of flooding and, and the, the future of the coast to be more, um, more aware of other types of climate hazards, to be more inclusive of things like the health implications and, and things. So as Chief Resilience Officer, we started to just kind of redefine the, the issue to be um, to allow more state agencies come in and, and talk about the problem. So I think my, my main solution here is, is a governance model that does kind of re reach across different actors uh, in state government. Um, so that's what we set up that we also empowered the CRO to engage directly with, with federal agencies who had programs that were kind of happening in, in different parts, and then also reach down to communities to kind of really work with them to kind of go after grant funds to, to get access to the data they need to kind of think about the future and make plans uh, that made sense in there. And so by doing all that stuff, we're trying to address more of the, um, the cascading impacts of a flood uh, we're trying to address the things that might not have a home in a specific state agency, or it might not be somebody's specific job to work on it and provide a space where we can kind of um, address those long-term challenges uh, all the time. So thanks, that's, Charles. thanks. Perfect. Um, our next panelist is Palencia Mobley, and she is representing a local government perspective. So she and I work together probably. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I am currently a uh, private sector person, but formerly uh, served as the deputy director and chief engineer of Detroit's water and sewerage department and helped uh, split the utility during the city's bankruptcy into a regional water authority and a retail entity. Um, I will talk about a couple of different things that I think are critical in terms of a solution. Um, solutions have to be holistic. And whether it is at the local level, the state level, or the federal level, there is a need for interdisciplinary coordination. And a simple way of saying that is we all have to work together. We cannot operate in silos. And so at local levels, what I see is land use planning, economic development, and integrated infrastructure planning all need to occur at the same time. It's not just about what the city can do in terms of, or the, the local agency can do in terms of its public infrastructure. It's also about what the private corporations can do. And we do not think holistically enough. Um, we get so excited, particularly in urban environments that have seen a lack of investment. We get so excited when the big shiny thing wants to come, whether it's Amazon, not to name any names, or some other large corporation that wants to invest. These are the same places that wanted to invest and then they disinvested in the 70s and 80s and left you swaths of land that were vacant, overbuilt infrastructure, et cetera. And so we've got to think a little bit more about how we plan and allow these projects to come. Again, I'm in Southeast Michigan and you know we are probably the most racially segregated area in the entire country of the United States. We were in the 2010 census. I'm sure it's no different in the 2020 census. It's no reason I can step five minutes away from my house, literally cross the street, and there be absolutely um, you know, no diversity in terms of majority versus minority populations. And so I say all that to say, we've allowed urban sprawl here to dictate and control everything. And this is why land use planning is critical and essential 
we have the exact same population we basically had in the 50s and 60s, except we just have moved and increased uh, the land area. I believe it's almost by like a thousand percent. Like it's, it's an extreme number in terms of how much more built area we've created. And so I say all that to say, if we bring this all home, this is all about planning. Ultimately, we cannot stop these events. You can, I cannot build enough gray infrastructure to eradicate the next flood. But what I can do um, as someone in the public sector is figure out how to better plan, use and allocate existing resources and how to best leverage resources to have integrated, uh, implementable, actionable uh, infrastructure plans. Thank you. Thank you, Valencia. Uh, our last and sixth panelist is Ann Baker, and Ann's going to represent the advocacy perspective for us. Welcome, Ann. Great. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Anna Baker from the American Flood Coalition. Uh, just for a brief background on who we are, we are a national nonprofit, nonpartisan coalition focused on advancing flood adaptation solutions. Uh, we work to drive improvements to state and federal policy, and we support key champions like local elected officials who are members of our coalition, as well as state level agency leaders to advance flood adaptation overall. Um, I lead our local and state level efforts in our core geographies, which include states like Florida, Texas, North and South Carolina, and Iowa. Um, so that's a key part of our perspective I can bring to today's discussion, both from our local um, partner-based pilot projects, as well as at the state policy level. Um, my background in a nutshell, I'm a licensed landscape architect, so I started in the private sector working on uh, flood infrastructure projects, and, and after that moved into the policy and advocacy, advocacy space, uh, working with the Army Corps of Engineers, the Coastal States Organization, and now AFC for over five years um, at AFC. Uh, but yeah, in terms of the one solution, we do a lot of work at AFC. We've engaged a lot with Charles and other uh, state level resilience leaders on taking a really systematic approach at the state level, looking at a framework for how state government can really um, step in and support some of these, um, especially technical and capacity and budget barriers at the local level. Uh, I think for today, uh, just to drill in a little deeper, I would highlight watershed level governance as a key solution. It's often a place where there are resource gaps. Um, planning was highlighted uh, very recently as such a critical space. And in many of the geographies where we work, being able to organize data, um, to prioritize projects, and to ensure that communities of different sizes and backgrounds are really being considered and are able to step into a holistic kind of watershed scale um, approach is a really important solution and one that we've been doing a lot of thinking about. So I'll leave it there and pass it back to you. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of the panelists for being quick and, and, and getting right to the point on this. We're going to now open the floor to our facilitators from the four breakout sessions from day one, starting with Sarah Hughes, who is an associate professor at the University of Michigan and a senior policy researcher at the RAND Corporation. Again, the facilitators are going to briefly present a set of discussed complex barriers or challenges, and the panelists are each going to have about 10 minutes to debate and explore innovative, coordinated, integrated solutions, especially those that align with your sectors. We want to hear from you. And in parallel, again, I want to remind the audience to submit your ideas for solutions through the online Slido platform. Again, solutions right now instead of challenges or questions. Attendees are also invited to upvote solutions. So if you love an idea that you see as innovative or cross-cutting, please make sure you upvote that solution. And all the instructions can be found in the chat. So our team is leading on that. Um, Sarah, I will turn it over to you. You represent the blue, green, and gray infrastructure breakout group. What are the major takeaways you want to share with the with the panel today? Great. Yes, thank you. We had um we had a great conversation. We did the, the World Cafe model. So I think we had three different groups uh, come through in the end. Um, it was hard to narrow down my takeaways, but I will I will give it a shot. I think um, 
Some of the key themes I heard were uh, on the challenges side, let's say challenges around permitting and funding for green infrastructure in particular and people navigating those. Um, we had a lot of discussion around how to build and maintain trust of communities, especially when it comes to doing things in a new or innovative way. I'd say that's a theme I've been hearing today as well. Um, we've talked to about the, the sort of nuance and tailoring that's, that's involved in building the sort of health equity co-benefits into infrastructure projects and those infrastructure investments. Um, and that that could generate that need to tailor um, our solutions could generate new knowledge gaps as we go, let's say. Um, when we shifted to solutions, we talked about uh, some of the same themes we just heard, the importance of cross-sectoral, cross-department planning in order to really capture and um, embed the full range of benefits in infrastructure investments. Um, really talked about, again, the importance of partnership and relationship building as integral to, uh, to any solution and even identifying the solutions that make the most sense in a place. Um, we discussed the importance of building capacity for grant seeking or you know, uh, going after different pots of state and federal funding. Um, we know that having the resources to invest in in projects that that mitigate that mitigate flooding that that promote health equity, you know, requires resources. And um, communities talked about uh, or different different folks were talking about the importance of building that capacity so that they could go after that um, the go after those resources. And then the last um, solution, I'd say, sort of maybe somewhere between a solution and a challenge, but is the importance of investing in infrastructure before there's a problem and just how valuable it can be to be thinking about planning for, um, you know, gathering the resources needed to make investments and build the partnerships um, that are needed before, before the solution comes as opposed to um, after it's already happened. Thank you, Sarah. Well, I wanna, um, I think they're gonna put everybody on the screen for us for this next bit. The, I, I guess I would love to start with Nicole. Nicole, will you kind of give us your um, thoughts, your take on that? Especially would love to hear, especially from an industry perspective, I think this makes good sense. What does it mean for you to invest in infrastructure before there's a problem? Yeah, you know, I, I think that we've, we've uh, come a long way as a field. Um, I think Congress has become a little bit uh, more sensitive to it. The multi-billion dollar investment in theme is building resilient infrastructure and communities program. The BRIC program is one example that is beginning uh, really based on rebuild by design. So going back to how we open the day and rebuild uh, by design uh, did, I think, what it was intended to do. It didn't just fund those projects. It showed the art of the possible and the need and um, what can be accomplished and how many additional resources can be attracted when you set a, a sort of an ambitious vision to drive down risk before an event. Now, of course that was after an event, but the national competition um, really, I think made communities alert. And then we've seen tremendous progress in the last 10 years. Of course, to uh, meet the Sendai framework, we all need to work um, you know, harder and faster and with more collaboration and innovation. Um, you know, to me, one of the things that it can be a key driver in uh, making progress in response to to uh, what we're what we're discussing is uh, kind of something that doesn't cost any money. And that is taking that uh, watershed level approach that was just mentioned or a regional approach and harmonizing, even just harmonizing policy and deadlines and building grant incentives in for climate adaptation and, and, and resilient approaches can dramatically reshape how, um, how dollars are used so that we amplify the benefits. And, you know, it's the same concept of of uh, delivering co-benefits to communities. And this is very relevant to our conversation, of course, because health benefits have to be part of how that is framed. And so I think, you know, my experience, cooperative agreement 
on a big ambitious vision attracts funding. Everyone kind of wants to be part of a winning team. I, I don't really like that that turn of phrase, but the reality is that when people see something ambitious that has potential, they're excited about it. It taps into their passion and they wanna be part of contributing to the solution. And that creates these kind of ripples uh, that create movement uh, to challenge, you know, really vexing problems and to help us, um, you know, fight the climate crisis in a coordinated way. Thank you. Anybody else want to tackle that? What's here? So what I will say is that there, there's always when something happens and it's flooding in most locals, it gets put on the water department or the public works department, depending on what that level of coordination is because it's water. Uh, but oftentimes there are some issues that actually have nothing to do with the water or the public works department. There are things that happen due to uh, changes in river levels, right? And you have flooding coming over a seawall that is private property that isn't even in the public domain. So a, a big piece of this is there's a lot of money out now through Bill and IIJA and very specific types of programming, but Again, most of the funding for some of this work, particularly when you start talking about green infrastructure and or traditional gray infrastructure projects, people are going to look to water departments and or those public utility agencies to pay for those projects. Um, in most places, that's the cash cow, so to speak, right? Uh, but that's not the only place. And that's why I keep bringing up holistic coordinated planning. So when we talk about watershed level planning, we have to know that this is going to be interjurisdictional, right? Water doesn't know the boundaries. Water could care less if I'm on this side of eight mile, if I'm north of eight mile or side, it does not care. So how do we look at things in a way that says, okay, this is how the water wants to move. What type of projects allow us to facilitate that water moving? And then again, um, we have to be mindful that the way the infrastructure funding is coming down in terms of water infrastructure, it is absolutely nothing. Like it is minuscule and people think it's a lot of money, but I, you know, literally it's 50 billion, right? I could have taken 50 billion and invested it in the infrastructure in Southeast Michigan and probably made like a little bit of a dent, but not, you know, expanded that out to the, you know, 80 plus communities that are some portion of that the system. So I think we all have to be mindful that the bill is due on water infrastructure. And what makes a lot of things very, very challenging right now, particularly when it comes to flooding, is we don't have the most reliable, predictable models about what's happening. A lot of people don't even have models of how their sewer system functions today. So let alone what is going to happen when there is some catastrophic event. And so there's a lot of planning and due diligence that now has to go into getting us to where, you know, Nicole was talking about, because ultimately we need to be able to layer a lot of funds together. And in locals, most locals, unless you are a large local, and even if you're a large local, you have to hire somebody that can help you navigate how to apply for these grant funds. You generally, you can have the most talented team ever you generally are not going to be able to navigate that process on your own. You're going to need assistance. And we just need to be uh, mindful mindful of that. Thank you. Any other solutions that we really need to be thinking about, especially in terms of the green, gray, um, and, and blue infrastructure? Anybody want to throw another one out? Go, Charles. I would just add, you know, I think that two of the challenges that were mentioned were just kind of like that we all kind of alluded to also was just kind of the um, the, the need for these cross sectoral partnerships and then also um, to build capacity for all this grant sink that uh, Polinsky was just talking about. Um, I, I found that like, you know, the, the grant is the is the vehicle to to do that partnership building. And it can be and on the one hand, you know, we had all these meetings and it's it's all theoretical about how we should partner and yeah, that sounds good, but it's just it's, it was just talk until the, an opportunity presented itself through one of these Bill or Ira grants. And I think we found that we had a lot more progress, a lot more um, true partnership when we had a reason to go out and engage the community to, to get some money or and we had a reason to kind of 
meet more than once a quarter to talk about what could happen if it flooded. And, and so it really was, I just wanted to kind of highlight the, the opportunity of Bill and I, I totally agree that the, the dollars are not as um, impressive as they look when you roll them all up to the big federal spend. And that should not be a once in a lifetime opportunity. It should probably be more regular than that. But given what it is, it's still, it, it could be a way to kind of jumpstart a partnership. And you might not get that NOAA grant or that EPA grant. But now you've got a partner. Now you've got a. Um, now you've been talking to the community. Hopefully, you've got a project in mind that you can kind of take with you to CDBG, or you can take it to your HMGP program, or you can take it to your state legislator. And I think that that's the kind of long term um, stuff that we need to be doing anyway. And this can just be an opportunity to kind of get the ball rolling. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Anna. I'll just add briefly, I'm dropping in the chat a link to a really small example of this, building on those examples. It's a great example of multiple communities of varying sizes, some quite small communities coming together um, to pursue a vulnerability assessment that was designed for single communities. They proactively banded together and kind of navigated that and used the grant as a vehicle. So whether it's, you know, large, large dollars or a state-funded vulnerability assessment. It's a great opportunity. Thank you. Better, Jesse, any last comments? Sure. You know, um, in listening to a lot of the discussion, one of the things that comes to my mind is, you know, how do we avoid a repeat of the urban renewal movement of the 1960s and 70s that divided Black communities, destroyed businesses and economic progress. I live next to Durham, North Carolina, and they had Black Wall Street in the Hayti section, built a highway right through it, and it just destroyed the community. And the, the effects of that are still pervasive. So you know, we talk about pulling out maps and seeing where it's going to flood. I think one of the first maps that needs to get pulled out are the, the redlining maps. And every city has them and really look at the historic discrimination that allowed people to be placed in areas that were prone to flooding and then really look at how do we repair that? How do we repair that? How do we uh, assure that um, there's a flood insurance for people that have been historically redlined in the flood prone, prone areas? How do we assure that when properties are condemned, you know, residents are receiving valuations that are adjusted for that historic redlining and then allowing them to uh, be able to afford a replacement property within their municipal jurisdiction. So I think to engender trust in communities, I think it's important to really lay the history of why things are the way they are on the table. And speaking of laying things on the table, I think it's important that we also always mention mitigation and the fact that until we curb greenhouse gas emissions, we're never going to be able to address these problems, and these problems are going to exacerbate and worsen for future generations. Thank you. Well, from that, well, we're going to move on to Megan Williams. Um, thank you to all the panelists for answering that first question. The second, um, the second panel discussion was on economy, recovery, resilience, and stability. Megan Williams is a registered professional engineer and civil engineer. She serves as the Urban Water Program Manager at the City of New Orleans Office of Resilience and Sustainability. Megan, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the major takeaways for your group so the panel can react? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> some of the things we talked about in the uh, economic recovery and resilience and st stability uh, breakout room, one of the, the big things we talked about was uh, the complications of evacuation. Um, that was a big issue here in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Um, and I think sometimes we forget about the cost of uh, evacuation routes, evacuation access, uh, where people go once they are evacuated. That was a huge issue, especially when it's a mass evacuation. Um, access to people who maybe have disabilities as well. Um, I think there, there was a lot of uh, conversation around the complexities of what that means to um, substantially fund evacuation access. Um, that was one of the, the big topics in the first um, breakout room. We also talked about the um, economics of mitigation, both the public mitigation as well as the private mitigation. So for citizens, it's often uh, elevating their homes if they're in flood prone areas. Um, a lot of those uh, grants that are available are 
hard to access. Uh, there, there are some barriers in and of itself just to submit an application for that. There's a lot of assistance that's needed uh, to gain access to uh, those funds that are available. And public mitigation is also very expensive. And that tends to be focused and to benefit the most wealthy areas most of the time as well. Um, that also kind of adds to the complexities of gentrification, which was a big topic for us as well. Um, most of these uh, implementations, whether it be large scale green infrastructure or uh, gray infrastructure investments, home elevations, they are highly targeted to those who are either already wealthy or areas that can be wealthy at some point. And it often pushes people out of their own uh, their own neighborhoods. Um, and one of the big complexities we talked about in terms of economics is the disjointedness of the uh, federal families, so to speak. And I believe it was Nicole that talked about it. Um, with all of the federal dollars that are out there, there are a lot of different policies that are required. There are a lot of just different requirements in general. Um, it's a huge lift to even submit for a lot of these grants that come to mind. Uh, the local match can be a lot. The state match can be a lot for some areas. Um, and they all just have such different deadlines and requirements and all these, you know, all the red tape that you typically have to go through for federal funding. Um, and that can create a barrier, particularly to smaller communities that may not have the most experience in that. Um, and one of the solutions we did talk about to sort of uh, curb the idea of of green gentrification is investing in the and fostering relationships in the local communities where a lot of these flooding areas are happening. So pouring those economics back into the community and into the businesses and uh, the different organizations that are operating at the ground level within those neighborhoods. Thank you, Megan. Well, I would love to, I think Jesse was going to um, start or answer the last question. So I'd love to start with you. I'd love to hear your reaction to, to the breakout session. No, that's uh, those are excellent points. And, you know, one of the things that definitely came through is the importance of making sure that we have uh, communities involved in the conversations. A lot of times we either have these at too high of a level or we don't actually involve the community in the early part. And that's one of the things that I've definitely, with interactions with communities that I've had in the past, um, one of the big limitations, especially when you're talking about local entities, that lack of ability to go for some of these grants. And I think one of the panelists in the uh, previous section was talking about that, where they're trying to be involved with the community, but then also uh, trying to write for these grants. And sometimes, although done and with good intentions, there's been a lot of um, uh, issues that have been come up with some of these grant funding opportunities that make it more challenging for communities to go after this funding. And there are, you know, like was mentioned, there's not as much money now as there was, or there's more money now than there was in the past, but we're still dealing with historical issues that are causing um, huge disparities in a lot of these communities as well. One of the things I really like to see moving forward is more of these private public academic partnerships, kind of what similar to something maybe that Ann was putting up in the, in the chat. Um, I think it was the University of Indiana or Purdue, I forget, uh, had a really nice partnership where they were helping with grant funding and going for grant funding for communities. I think this is a potential model that can be out there uh, I know from my own ex uh, experience as an academic, that is a large portion of what I do is going after grant funding, managing grant funding. And so providing that kind of a resource to the community is, I think, incredibly beneficial. One of the other things that I highly recommend, this is one of the things that we're actually working on, and this kind of talks about those evacuation routes, but one of the things I um, am always thinking about is in the context of healthcare. And whenever we see some of these disasters, it's healthcare uh, that typically has to respond to the, the issues at hand. Whether that was Hurricane Maria that hit Puerto Rico, where they estimated that one third of the um, excess deaths was a result of a lack of access to care. Or uh, when you see things that happen like here in, in Nebraska, where we had major flooding events that limited people's access to hospitals. And that's where I think, you know, every hospital, healthcare facility, uh, nursing home, 
pharmacy, et cetera, should be thinking about creating climate action plans for their facility and flood action plans. Um, for example, uh, the medical center here, when we had major flooding, all of a sudden we had uh, populations, healthcare professionals that weren't able to actually make it to the hospital. And so all of a sudden we faced uh, staffing issues locally, but you can see this time and time again. So I think that's something else that we should be thinking about uh, more collectively and working with our communities to make sure that we're identifying these issues, especially in the context of healthcare. Thank you. I think Ben mentioned in the last section about redlining, redlining maps. I know in, in my community of Mobile, Alabama, I, I know in many of our ours across the Gulf South, but probably nationally, our redlining maps often put people in the way of a disaster. They put them in the low-lying flood-prone areas. And there are challenges to how do you fund fixing up an older home? How do you do it in a way that doesn't over-gentrify and then move people out or disproportionately affect them financially? Or you can't do it because you're still then rebuilding a house that is remaining in a flood zone. Are those issues that y'all have thought about? Are y'all seeing any areas where there are solutions in that to that to that end? Uh, Charles is not muted, so it's going to be him. But I, well, I was going to say something else, but I'll, I'll answer that first. I mean, I think that's where, and this is maybe something Anne was kind of raising. Like, we need to see not just cooperation at the state level, but if the Army Corps has a has an elevation program, it can't be independent of HUD's. Uh, you know, um, installation and weatherization program, independent of EPA's solar for all program. We need to find a way, because like you said, the, these homeowners, um, some programs will pay for relocation while they're elevating your home. Some will, some will pay for this. Some will. People aren't, aren't getting like a, an actual resilient home necessarily from some of these programs. And they've got to align across the different FEMA, you know, core, the whole, all the whole, the whole, the whole deal buckets so that these programs are, are are more useful to people. And and we've not had tons of success in getting that to happen. You know, the, the core is elevating more homes than they ever have in Southwest Louisiana. It's long overdue, but it's also like a lot of people already had their home destroyed by the two hurricanes in, in 2020. And so it's, it's just a lot to ask them to participate in a program at, at this point in it. Um, so I'll stop with that. If, if people, other people want to respond to that point, and then I'll come back to some other things that had for May and later. Uh, yeah, I, one of the things that, that we're seeing a lot, um, I live in the Azores, Portugal, although I work all, you know, all over the world and predominantly in North America. Um, so in the EU for over a decade, they have already um, had codified in law regulation and policy, the notion of changing the flood fight. And when I supported uh, as a flood advisor to the city, city of Calgary, when they had a major flood in 2013 to the Bow and Elbow Rivers, um, we were able to activate for their, they don't have flood in, well, they're about to make the jump into the private market for flood insurance. And we'll see, I, I, I wish Canada well with that. And I hope we can help them with that because we have a lot of lessons in the US, right? Um, but one of the things that, that, that they did was after a home was flooded, if it had 50% more, 50 or more damage, so it was a major rehabilitation or replacement, they offered the household the opportunity for relocation. But the concept of changing the flood fight is when you give the opportunity for local government to pull back the infrastructure and then either support or not support perhaps based on means testing, whether or not they give people redundant energy and other solutions to manage their their their, their, their utility needs for the home. Because we're seeing communities um, in, in Tampa, in St. Petersburg, in New Orleans, that you know, New Orleans is a little bit different because of the operation at scale, but we're seeing communities consider pump systems that are billion dollar systems to support 50 houses, 100 homes, 200 homes, often for affluent households or upper middle class households at the expense borne by the entire community. And so I really uh, think that we need to put on the table, not just wholesale retreat, but pulling back the infrastructure, which will save hundreds of millions of dollars in operating costs and allow communities to invest in infill and other equitable development in lower hazard areas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other ideas? Yep, Valencia. 
just really quickly, the way the cost benefit analysis is done in the federal uh, programs need to change. It definitely values higher income properties or higher valued properties more than others. But at the end of the day, should we be benefiting the number of square feet or should we be benefiting the number of people? If you work in the nonprofit sector, anybody who funds you wants to know how many lives have you impacted? How many households did you touch? How many people did you touch? And so the way we currently do the BCAs has to change so that it actually values human life over property. Because right now, that is not how any of that is set up. And it drives you to prioritizing people who, quite honestly, you know, I talk about climate migrants all the time. They can quickly move to Michigan, you know, Illinois, Indiana, you know, Wisconsin, and never bat an eyelash and pay a million dollars for a house. And it, it you know, it's never going to bother them. But what about the people who cannot move? How are we ensuring that they're safe for the future? Um, and so it has to be more than just dollars and cents. We all have value as people. Thank you. And if I could, if I could jump in there, I, I think that was one of the points I was going to raise earlier. I think that you know, where possible, you if you are in charge of the metrics, you can change the metrics that you use to evaluate a project. I mean, getting the core to change. I know they're looking at some things right now. That's that's a federal battle for for all of us to participate in, but. At the state level, you know, we try to decide where does it make sense to raise homes, where does it make sense to um, build a levy versus not build a levy, and we used an economic damages um, formula for for the longest time. In this last master plan, we switched to a structure structure by structure. So if it's a house, it's a house. It doesn't matter if it's an expensive house or an inexpensive house. We want we measured it as one house, and so that gave us a a, a slightly less you know biased way to kind of look at the data. And the other thing that we did was we started um, just making this, the things that we knew about flood risk more available to more types of people. And so we know where um, cell phone towers are that are going to be impacted and daycare centers and um, all these other types of infrastructure. And again, like I was saying, our, our goal was to kind of enlarge the team of people who cared about flooding and, and were able to start doing things on adaptation. And so if we can take to the the, the health department all the local health facilities that are going to be flooded, I think to Jesse's point, now we have something to talk about and we can talk about projects and benefits and, and all these other things. Um, and we just started doing that in a more public kind of aggressive way um, in our most recent coastal master plan. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. I'm, I think I'm late, so I'm going to jump ahead. Um, we are supposed to move now to Laura Bozy, who is the Senior Director of Environmental Health Policy at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Laura, you represented the health and healthcare breakout group. What were the major takeaways that the panel can think about and reflect on? Thanks, Casey. Uh, you know, I think the overall uh, takeaway was a reminder that climate change acts as a threat multiplier, uh, enlarging existing inequities, including around health. So a few examples from our discussion. Uh, we discussed how there can be a mismatch of representation between the communities being served on the one hand and the healthcare workforce and decision makers on the other, leading to a bias in planning and response. We talked about how flooding events happen on top of other environmental exposures, worsening the cumulative impact. Uh, we talked about, as has been discussed a lot already today, the lack of knowledge about community needs and who's most impacted in the event and the lack of involvement uh, by affected communities. Um, and uh, Megan brought this up as well, priority populations during the flood events, uh, particularly people with mobility challenges and other disabilities, older individuals uh, and their caretakers. And we talked about uh, communication during the flooding event, uh, like when uh, phone networks go out and especially in rural areas that already have limited um, connectivity. Uh, we also discussed some knowledge gaps um, and uh, especially one area that was interesting was around the health impacts in non-hurricane areas with the idea that there may be less data collected or less research happening um, outside of, of hurricane events. Um, and there's a, an interest in collecting better data and studying the health effects of flooding. There, I think we can learn from uh, heat surveillance systems, uh, though recognizing that there are differences, especially around indirect and long-term impacts. We talked about um, a few solutions. Uh, one around building resilience to flooding by investing in communities and health systems, uh, particularly in BIPOC communities. 
Um, we talked about uh, engaging the affected communities in planning process um, and having the multi-sectoral approach. Uh, and making stronger linkages between the healthcare system. And actually this was kind of interesting, home repair services. But so the idea of like, how can you link um, at the moment that, that people are coming uh, for healthcare after an event, how can you link them with, with recovery services? That's it. Thank you, Laura. Um, before we get uh, to the panel entirely, I wanna remind everybody, all of our audience and attendees to submit your ideas through the, the Slido platform. <laughs> Both your ideas on solutions, the ones that Laura's presented, if you loved them, put them in there. And if you want to upvote the ones that already exist there, please make sure you do that as well. Um, I would love to start this time with Ben. Uh, ben, what do you think? What did, how does what Laura said affect you? Where do you see solutions in that? Uh, it definitely resonates, um, particularly when she discussed um, flooding and climate change really being a threat multiplier. I mean, we saw that. Um, in the southeastern portion of uh, North Carolina when Hurricane Florence hit, which was this hurricane event that was more of a rain event than a wind event. And what ended up happening is the flooding that occurred actually caused the hog lagoons. And if you know what a hog lagoon is, it's just a big feces pit for hog farms in the southeastern part of the state to just overrun. It overran and it contaminated people's wells. People got sick. Um, they, you know, walked out in this water and they had skin conditions. So the impact of flooding on human health um, is immediate. And then it's also long-term. Uh, long-term, when you think about the flood, you know, the impact with mold, but also just the the mental health impacts, particularly if people have to leave their community, their support system and structure and go to different places that where they don't have that kind of support system and structure. And then the loss of property values and, you know, property home value is probably the single source of wealth in this country. And the only thing in many instances it is transferable across generations. And when that is lost, then wealth is lost. And health and wealth are intricately uh, connected in this country. So one of the things that um, you know she mentioned was uh, linking patients uh, to flood programs when they come in for health care. And community health centers actually do that. And the health centers that have been more frequently impacted by flooding events or, or you know, really kind of expert at that, while they're also trying to navigate their own um, recovery um, program benefits from FEMA and the like. It's a very difficult and complicated scenario uh, that often takes years for that recovery to take place. So I think um, I can't remember who it was that mentioned earlier that, you know, folks that are wealthy have the opportunity to be able to relocate somewhere else. Well, they also have the opportunity in many instances to have a line of credit that they can access or other means to be able to start that recovery process where, you know, low income, um, uh, Black, Hispanic, um, Native Americans don't have that, that level, of, level of access. So um, I think that the health uh, community really has a role to support uh, their communities, their patients during, after, and that long term of um, recovery. Thank you. Um, anybody, Ann, I don't think you've gone in a second. Any ideas on solutions in the health and healthcare, health and hygiene area? Yeah, um, absolutely. And I'll also just voice over in the last conversation, I dropped some resources in the Slack. We are really focused on um, it's such a hurdle to access federal dollars and simplifying that process is a big um, priority for AFC. So please reach out if you have more thoughts on that broadly, which relates to this conversation and the previous one. Um, I think the uh, the lack of knowledge about community needs is something we encounter a lot in our daily work. And as a nonprofit that operates between the local, regional, state, and federal levels, we put a lot of energy into just making sure that those stories are coming to the forefront. Um, 
there are opportunities to do simple things in policy, like reducing cost share for key communities, um, for uh, really highlighting for elected leaders at the state and federal le levels, examples of successes in their districts when it comes to those sort of health flood overlaps and also just the broader community needs that are happening. So one of the things we do at AFC is each year we um, do a small group of local pilot projects where we're trying to dig in in detail to those issues so that we can then um, be a part of expanding those stories. Um, so I'll leave it there. I know that's quite broad, but in case that prompts other thoughts. Thank you. Anybody want to jump or I'll, I'll call Nicole? Uh, yeah, just, you know, I, I look to the hospital that was lost in Hurricane Ian, which was absolutely preventable because it was clear that it had not had a, a modern upgrade to the roof. Um, uh, and, and the impacts that we've seen on nursing homes throughout the, the Gulf South, but in particular in recent years in Florida, where we have lost vulnerable people because they were uh, not evacuated, um, it, beginning to, again, reinforce the conversation that my, my co-panelists co have talked about with regard to identifying vulnerable populations and, and understanding who who is networked in and able to support them and having them be part of the emergency management enterprise. We do not have hospital administrators. We do not have networks of case workers uh, as a standard practice. We do not have translators as a standard practice as part of people who are designated as essential personnel who are part of risk communications, who are identified and have a badge and can get into an impact zone to be part of the emergency operations center where key decisions are made. So uh, I know that's very kind of temporally specific, but it's really essential that we support health serving institutions to understand their vulnerabilities and risks, and also making sure that the people who are connected to the webs of our most vulnerable populations have real authority to be agents of information and change and exchange and shape decisions that are made um, pre-positioned uh, during the incident management and in post-disaster response and recovery. Thank you, Nicole. Jesse, I want to ask you this question really briefly, just because you've got medicine on your over your shoulder right there. Thanks. Do you see a simple way to ensure that hospitals get some kind of a climate action plan or at least engage with their local governments to look at flooding? And again, from a solution perspective, do you see some way we can, we as communities or cities or even states can ensure that's happening? Well, I think well, the easiest way is is regulation on that, and um, and you can see that through uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, saying that they enact something where if you have a climate action plan, then you're eligible for Medicare, uh, Medicaid. But I would say also, kind of more broadly, um, I would love to see, you know. You know, we've talked about it. Uh, there was a study that came out of CDC, 9% of hospitals, 10% of nursing homes, and 12% of pharmacies are in flood prone areas. Or that's, that's a big number. And when you do see climate action plans enacted, I would love to see those enacted within e each of these types of healthcare facilities, especially flood resiliency plans and flood action plans in those areas that are in the, the most flood prone areas. But making sure that they're doing it in a systematic way that engages with local health departments, but also engages with the community, understand the needs of the community more broadly. That's where I think if if they could if there could be a more unified, and I think that's one of the things that Nicole was bringing up is a more unified system for these healthcare facilities to be able to enact these plans, so that they have kind of a model that they can follow and basic outline so that they can do it in the best way possible. I think that would be, um, I'd be a huge step forward. Thank you. I think, well, so for our fourth and final session, 
Um, let's turn to Venkat Laksh Laksh Lakshmi, sorry, who has been a co-chair with me on this adventure. He is the John L. Newcomb Professor of Engineering and the Department of Civil Engineer, Civil Envi and Environmental Engineering at the University of Virginia. Venkat, you represent the Social Cohesion and Housing Breakout Group. What were the major takeaways for that panel and how that they can think about and react on? I can't hear him. Can y'all hear him? Ben, can, that, can you hear us? It seems that we're we, having we're trouble. We're not able hearing. to hear you. Can you hear me now? Sorry. So one of the things with this section was the one of the biggest challenges faced were as much lack of information as a lack of resources. So which is telling a lot in this day and age with so much information at hand and inadequate risk information or disclosure, insufficient resources to relocate or to build up resilience became major factors. Uh, it was also noted that safe, safe housing sometimes reflected generational wealth. So people with safe uh, housing, once they're impacted by a flood disaster, they're not able to build it back. And then greater challenges persist, especially lack of accessible uh, access to safe land. So when somebody loses a house in a disaster, it's not just the house as in a physical structure, but it's also the cultural and the emotional connection and the sense of place. So that becomes a really, really hard thing for some people to let go. You know, it doesn't matter uh, who they are. Further thinking, the, the participants do not have the power to change the, the, the especially zoning and being a civil engineer, you know, I know a lot about zoning, though I never practiced the business as much as I should have. Uh, you know, if you permit risky development in, you know, in, in flood prone zones, you're in trouble. I mean, you're asking for trouble. It's like those people who keep building beach houses year after year only to see their insurances grow. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a foolish idea. So it's also emphasized that the communities have to take an active role in the design and implementation and adaptation uh, challenges and strategies. And this should not be a one-sided affair. It has to be a two-pronged affair when everybody gets together to do it. So some of the potential solutions and the participants were very interested in solutions was uh, you know, community-led relocation, institutional transformation. So not just trying to make small surficial changes, but wholesale changes. You know, this some of this being a federal policy, you know, designing accurate uh, floodplain, uh, you know, maps. You know, you, you, you have to do that. And, and as I started this, this whole meeting today, uh, you know, saying that, look, you know, a hundred year flood means nothing. I mean, it's a, it's a moving target. It's, a, it's not stationary, you know, flood risk is not stationary. I mean, the statistically speaking and partnership, uh, for education, collaboration, and uh, problem solving. And then the potential of using the tools and partners to assist, uh, training master gardeners, you know, you want to have a lot of infiltration and reducing the benefits for low income housing tax credit in high disaster areas will solve some, if not all the problems. Thank you. Thank you, Venkat. Uh, well, I would love to start this response with Palencia. What are you, any ideas in that for you? So I think he hit the nail on the head with a couple different things, and it really does come down to where we allow things to go. Um, a lot of our land use planning is disjointed and disconnected. And, you know, I worked in a place where there was no stormwater ordinance within the city of Detroit it ended up being a uh, national pollution uh, elimination system permit requirement. Uh, it went in around 2013. And then um, as I started in my role in 2016, I went through the process of having a stormwater ordinance and acted in Detroit. But again, these are things that also need cohesion. What are the other counties doing? Because Detroit is a blip. It's at the bottom of the system, relatively speaking, and it built a wastewater system that serves 
you know, most of Southeast Michigan. So again, how we regulate development in Detroit, of course, is important. But again, how do the different policies and ordinances that exist at a county level, uh, as well as some cities had slightly different things than what their counties enacted, um, how do we actually make sure these things all work together? So that is a huge thing. Um, we had a situation here where, you know, the flood plain was really increasing. The, the zone of influence of where it could flood was increasing and you had people, um, you know, going back and forth about whether or not we could reduce, you know, what FEMA was saying in terms of what the line of demarcation was going to be. Well, people have already built here. Let's just be clear. We can't build anything else here. And though the chance is minute, um, we had a situation about three years ago, four years ago, where the, maybe five, I'm sorry, because I miscount, um, where the river level kept raising. And it wasn't that we were getting this water. All of a sudden, the Detroit River decided it wanted to be a waterfall and, you know, come over land. Um, and so it was all private property too. It was not like this was happening. And then the regional authority had to turn on all these storm pumps and constantly pump out river water. So we've got to rethink how we do things and then create policies that make sense. Ultimately, you know, could there have been a loan program that allowed homeowners no interest loans to fix their uh, flood walls? Or could the city have taken it, you know, on itself? There were some U.S. Army Corps studies and some other things going on. And though it was a very rare occurrence, we don't know that that rare occurrence won't continue to happen based on what we're seeing. Thank you. Anyone else want to pile into that conversation? Critical? Yeah, just one comment. Um, I think that this group is is sensitive to and should support the the de vilification of people who live in the floodplain. I think there's a lot of talk about the millionaire who lives on the beach, but what we know is that most of the people who live in areas of flood risk, not just coastal, but inland flooding, riverine flooding, and even you know cloud burst and big pluvial events, um, are everyday working people. And so I, 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 I think it's critical that we see a communitarian set of solutions being advanced that acknowledges that these are the people who run our communities for us, right? These are the people who are driving transit. They're teaching our kids. They're our nurses. We, they're the heart of our community. So how we take care of them is how we take care of our, our, uh, our how, how we, how we do as a community. And so, um, I know it's a kind of simple point, but in the discussion about who lives in a flood zone, I think we really lose um, that kind of sometimes our humanity and, and do want to kind of echo back uh, what Ben was talking about, which is that we have multi-generational, historic, institutionalized bias and racism that has influenced the decisions and where people live. You know, we see that in New Orleans all the time. We see it in Detroit and uh, we need to we need to acknowledge it and make sure the equity is at the center of what we do. I want to add one comment. Uh I was in a panel about a month ago, and as we were brainstorming about different things we were going to talk about, I asked, had anybody seen Katrina Babies? And that, just the trailer, I played the trailer to bring people back to the, the one piece of this. This is about humanity. At the end of the day, this is about humanity and civility. And so if we don't respect who we consume, who, who we engender to be the least of us, then we obviously don't respect the most of us. And so there has to be a mutual respect because there is ultimate multiple benefits for us making sure everyone uh, can thrive and lives in a place that they want to live in and that they desire to be in. And are safe living in. Excellent point. Ben, you had your mute button off. Did you want to add in here? I also saw Charles behind you. I was just asking about uh, just the, the time frame for solutions that we propose. You know, we talk about, you know, changes to uh, river flow and, and, and you know, uh, flooding, uh, um, you know, mitigation efforts. But when you look at the climate projections out to 2050, 2100, I mean, what you see are, is just a massive erosion of the East Coast. And, you know, I'm wondering if we're investing in short-term solutions, but ignoring sort of this longer-term problem that, 
you know, folks that actually are alive right now, I'm thinking about my two grandsons, are going to be faced with. And should we not really factor in uh, those climate projections into what we're doing in 2024? Well, Charles, this is probably a perfect question for you to answer too. I know you, as a chief, as a past chief resilience officer, and you have a point, you have a question you want to raise? I would just, yeah, I, mean, I would just say absolutely, Ben. You know, in Louisiana, we've been trying to show projection every five years because we you know the science changes. And, and, and it goes along, I think your point's really important too. It's not just about the data and the kind of what the future holds, but it's also about this idea of the um, scale too. So I think while we're while we're partnering with communities and while we're going super local and ground up, we've also got to have our eye on the big things that we've got to do at this giant landscape scale that's going to make a huge difference for giant pieces of, of our populations. And so we, we can't lose track of either of those two things as we're doing, we've got to bring the community along, we've got to partner with them, but we've also got to be advocating for something that's probably going to take 25 years to get built um, if we can fund it, you know what I mean? And we've got to be pushing those things at the same time. And so absolutely got to have the data in there. You know, Louisiana is constantly faced with that, like, is this place even going to be here um, by the time we get this project built? Um, that is, it is, it is existential here in the coastal space, but it is also... Um, as as important to think about that for these other types of flooding, for the rainfall events and, and the riverine floods. Um, um, so anyway, I just really appreciate, and I appreciate Nicole's point earlier. And I guess I would say too, just to kind of, we just know how complicated it is to undo all these things. And so I would just make another push that we just kind of focus on not adding more risk to the books, that, which is what we all are doing in all of our communities everywhere, every day. And I don't understand why. So if there, there are ways to bring you know some of this information forward into the present so maybe you're maybe you can't get the zoning commission maybe you can't get the, the the political stuff but even at least in the hands of the homeowner who's making that decision do i want to live in this neighborhood or that neighborhood there's a there's an equity piece to it though. i mean sometimes those are more affordable homes um we need affordable housing but like casey said it has to be safe affordable housing we can't um misunderstand what the, the cost of ownership looks like. If you're going to lose your home, then it's not that affordable anymore. So uh, that's, that's an, another thank point. And I want to say thank you to all of our panelists. Um, and if somebody didn't write, stop adding more risk to the problem and the solutions, please do that for me right now. Um, you're Y'all are amazing. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I, this has been thoughtful, rich contributions, building on each other's thoughts. Y'all have been phenomenal. Thank you. So to the pan the attendees and to y'all as well, panelists, um, if your solutions were not posted in the Slido by our audience, please make sure you take a second to do that. Um, and of course, if you have also make sure that you add in your upvotes so that we can we can kind of vote on which solutions we're going to go through. When we're what we're going to do next, um, we're going to take a little bit of a break, but then we're going to um, break into small groups and discuss those solutions. So. The way it goes is for the next five minutes, the audience is invited to upvote solutions presented in the Slido. And after that five minutes, the most popular 20 solutions will be distributed into the breakout rooms for discussion and friendly debate. Um, when we return, Megan Williams from the city of New Orleans will moderate our next discussion of our workshop. So thanks y'all panelists and we can all take a couple minute break. We'll start off with the facilitator from the breakout room one. So Casey, if you could provide a recap of your breakout room. Sure. Um, so I think, oh, sorry. Can you hear me? There we go. Um, I, well, I think Ben Cotton and I did this together. So I will ask, I'll, I'll start and have him add in. Um, we had a, a really good, uh, really good group, a uh, very quiet group, but they all, I think, had some of the same worries and concerns. I think our first item that we talked about was um, was giving uh, grants or micro grants to individuals. And I think there was concern about what does that mean and what does that do? Uh, making sure that we focus that on, you know, for individuals, making sure that it was focused on a home level project or a micro level project but then really feeding and hearing what individuals and community members are, are needing to be engaged and want to see as solutions, that needs to be encouraged, incentivized. Um, we can't keep asking people, I think we heard it in earlier sessions as well, we can't keep asking individuals to come tell us what they want 
without really putting forward something to actually do that. Um, I would say there were several others, but the one I wanna also just kind of underscore and land on is stop adding more risk was real. Uh, a solution that wasn't mentioned, um, wasn't written on the jam boards or, or in, the, in the Slido was that FEMA getting out of the insurance business because that's potentially incentivizing people staying where they are um, is is a, another good solution. But Venkat, you want to add to that? Yeah, I think some of the things which the participants chimed in is that, you know, I mean, I brought up the idea of how do you how do you make it easy for community members to participate in this uh, in these discussions? And uh, some of them had very innovative ideas like, you know, gift cards or dinner or whatever. And also one of the things which is very interesting in this in this conversation was trying to figure out uh, problems beforehand. And I think Casey raised a pretty interesting question of what happens in a university town, public university town, you know, so to which I responded saying that, you know, you, you have to have the two sides come together as seldom is that so easily done. So, you know, we talked about these things and, and one of the things which, you know, I may not have mentioned in all these two days is, you know, the problem of aging earthen dams and their potential to cause a big flood if overtopped or breached in a in a heavy rainfall. So, you know, there is a lot of things, but one of the most important things this groups came away with was, you know, empowering the community and making sure that two sides meet with each other. Thank you. Thank you, Casey and Venkat. We'll move on to room two with Megan. Uh, yeah, we had the uh, economic recovery and resilience and strategy room. Uh, we talked a lot about AI um, and how AI can be used as a resource uh, or to help boost resources internally, whether through uh, proposal writing, uh, potentially grant writing. Uh, one way that was mentioned is that it can reference uh, past information and we can use it to sort of have conversations to understand where people were coming from in the past and uh, to identify some things that may have been missed. Um, we could use AI to review uh, policy and procedure compliance. Um, depending on the grants, there's there's lots of uh, rules and regulations. So ensuring that policies come that come forward are reflective of some of those things as well. We talked a lot about interagency coordination and collaboration. Um, and uh, sometimes we we tend to uh, maybe miss the the humanity associated within some of the processes that are put in place by a lot of the the agencies. Sometimes we tend to focus a lot on doing the thing, and we kind of miss the people that are affected by the thing, uh, which speaks a lot to the need for the coordination, not just with the interagencies, but as well as agencies with communities as well and community groups. Um, the Army Corps has some examples of uh, interagency programs uh, that require collaboration uh, with others, and they started to use this to help some of the more marginalized communities uh, to build resources and power. Um, and then something else that we really we talked about is uh, compensating the communities for a lot of the work that they do. Uh, we don't necessarily have a hard and fast solution on how to do that, but uh, maybe it's providing stipends to participate or providing a method to pay the participants for some of the work that they've done. Um, we talked a lot about understanding the historical context of a land and a community um, and making sure that we honor those things as we uh, progress into other solutions moving forward. Thank you, Megan. And we will move on to room three. I believe Tina Bardot is going to be the reporter from that group. Tina, are you with us? Oh, one second. Sounds like we will get, you're having trouble with your mic. We'll get that sorted for you. Why don't we, while we get that sorted out, why don't we move on to breakout room number? Oh, no, I, Tina's with us. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no worries. Sorry about that. Um, 
So yeah, we ended up spending quite a bit of time talking about kind of different issues with metrics and kind of how risk is not only perceived, but how also it is, uh, I guess, uh, talked about and how 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 well we're able to actually get to individuals who are you know at greater risk despite the inadequacy of uh, a lot of uh, FEMA designated flood, flood maps and floodplains. Um, so we were talking about how a lot of uh, communities and individuals uh, are not actually mapped well by FEMA, and I think that the um, that one of the the major points that we that was made was um, given the way that the different requirements for uh, flood insurance, for example, are you know often tied to these flood maps. It actually reduces the ability to uh, talk about and to um, to talk about and to talk um, and uh, communicate risk to individuals who might still be at risk, but despite not being um, in these flood maps, and even when they are, uh, they might not always be aware of it. And the their qualification for certain programs being contingent upon that renders it a lot more difficult for certain communities to be resilient if they don't have adequate uh, information. Uh, and so from there, we also talked a little bit about different avenues for sharing information and uh, using kind of existing infrastructure, uh, communication infrastructure and physical infrastructure, such as, you know, we were, I think nurses were mentioned. We also talked about, you know, using even like emergency rooms, but also people on food stamps, uh, as well as kind of empowering local community leaders that might be through churches or through schools um, by not only compensating them for their time, but also ensuring that they have adequate information and resources to share with not only the people that are in their community, but also to be able to kind of have, uh, I guess, cross-directional uh, information mechanisms so that, you know, there's a continuing conversation between people who are experiencing different types of flood risk and different types of environmental risk, uh, while also empowering them to um, adequately talk about the risks that they're perceiving and the risks that um, their communities uh, believe that they're facing as well. Um, I think, um, yes, there's trusted communities partners. Sorry, I'm, I'm just reading some of the notes, making sure. Uh, yeah, finding, finding systematic ways and trusted partners to share this kind of info. Um, and then uh, adding additional avenues for individuals to qualify for programs. So if there's like flood insurance programs or flood risk programs, uh, making sure that it's not just contingent upon, again, these uh, flood, like FEMA flood maps, I guess expanding the notion of what can qualify individuals for assistance and aid, especially prior to disasters happening, because responding to disasters, I mean, um, preparing for disasters is more effective and more cost effective than responding to them. So uh, I guess that's kind of some some of the key takeaways, but I might have missed some things, obviously. But yeah, it, it was a, a good conversation overall. Yeah, it looks like, uh, Laura, you were also in that room. If there's anything you'd like to add, if not, we will move on to breakout room four. That was great. Thank you, Tina. And I'll add one more piece. Uh, we also we started talking about um, tracking data. And so um, one piece to emphasize there is the importance of tracking um, health and social impacts of, um, of interventions for flooding, especially in the longer term. So, so that we understand issues like displacement or, um, or health outcomes uh, that relate uh, to flooding. Thanks. Thank you, room three. So we'll move on to breakout room four, which I believe will be Charles reporting back to us. Uh, and then once that summary is up, we will move on to our closing remarks for the day and we will hear from our co-chair Casey Calloway for that. Great, thank you, Sabina. Yes, I was um, facilitating breakout room four um, and we had five different solutions that we talked about very briefly. I'll just kind of quickly run through them. Um, we talked about uh, creating a government concierge um, so that we could create multiple agency packages. And we talked a little bit about what that might mean. Um, we weren't totally sure what a government concierge might be, but um, we're, we were kind of thinking it as a kind of a technical assistance hub, something that could break down these silos between agencies or organizations. And um, we also talked a lot about how grant writing is a barrier um, for communities. Um, our second 
Um, it, it fits right into our second solution, which was providing grant funding resources to communities. And we just wanted to highlight that, you know, funding, you need funding and assistance for writing the grants because grant writing is a major barrier as was discussed um, by earlier speakers. Um, we talked about the solution proposed to support de-vilification de of people who live in floodplains. Um, and we talked about, you know, understanding the history of an area, um, having humanity, um, community engagement and education um, to recognize the people who don't have a choice to live in a within a floodplain. Um, and we also talked about migration equity um, for those situations where migration becomes necessary. Um, and then finally, I'll just wrap up here because we're out of time. Uh, we, we did talk about some integrating climate adaptation into healthcare delivery. Um, and we just wanted to say that you need a framework that's easy to implement. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. I think that leaves it to me and I'm going to do my best to do two minutes worth of this. But first of all, just thank you. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you so much to the committee members who worked so hard to pull this together. I want to remind everybody that this is the beginning of a conversation. What the National Academies has pulled together with this series of climate workshops has been important. Go back and watch the first three and then make sure you tell people about them so that we can continue to build on the solutions. We learned a lot today. We learned a lot about the value and importance of community engagement. We learned about data being like, you get public support with data and data is useful, but it also may not be usable. So figuring out how to do that is critically important. We had conversations about how agencies run at cross purposes and that we need them to get on, get aligned with what is, what you're funding over here and not over there so that we can make sure we're all looking at the issues together. Um, watershed level governance. I loved, um, I think several folks, several panelists said that water does not care about your political boundaries. Uh, cost benefit analysis needing to change. And I love, um, I think it was Bronco who talked about infrastructure always being working in the dark and that the bill is due on our very old infrastructure. We've got what seems like a lot of money, but may actually not be when it comes down to it. Uh, so again, I want to stop there and thank everyone again for attending and being a part of this experience, and we have loved it, and we look forward to the next one.